Good afternoon, uh, Mayor, members of Council. My name is Stacey Poston. I'm the General Services Department here today to talk about an update on the 505 West Chapel Hill Street project and the progress that we've made. Okay. Okay. All right. We're making progress. All right. Super. Thank you. Okay. All right. So just clicking on that. Excellent. Okay, so I'm um, here today to talk to you about where we are at. We were last before council in November, um, asking for uh, seeking concurrence on the, RF, the draft RFP and the six priority goals. Council approved that from, uh, from that period of time. We um, issued an RFP. We have had developer interviews. We have had um, lots of Q&A with the development firms. And we're here today to recommend moving and advancing into negotiations with the People's Corporation. Um, I want to say today that the People's Corporation is here. Um, Donahue Peoples is here, as well as some other members of the team, uh, Samet Construction, HKS Architects, Surface 678, Thomas and & Hutton, and Minch Likens Engineering. So we have a number of um, developers from the People's Corporation here to answer questions um, should, should those uh, arise and we can't answer them ourselves. Additionally, I wanted to note that we've had a number of city department staff who are experts in their in their area of discipline um, participate in the evaluation of this, uh, answer questions, be supportive to the general services department as we've led this process. So Reginald and community development, always great help. Tim Flora and the finance department, Bo Dabrinsky and the planning department, and Sean Egan and the transportation department have all been intimately involved in this activities, as well as Kim and her team and the attorney's office. I should have put them up there. Apologies for that. Um, so as I mentioned, the RFP was released back in November after council concurrence. Uh, responses came in in March. Uh, the evaluation committee spent some time with the proposals. They are significant and uh, detailed proposals, both in the narrative form and in the financial form. Uh, we had developer in-person interviews here in Durham, and then we are at the stage now for council to consider um, staff's recommendations to advance. Um, so. We had six development priorities in the RFP that council approved, and I'm just gonna sort of run through those as a refresher to us all. Um, first, and uh, in, in, in priority order, was creation of a significant uh, number of affordable housing units at the 60% or below area median income. Um, and the intention was to try to make those units perpetually affordable for residents of our community. Additionally, we wanted to pursue preservation of the existing building um, and, and this is where we allowed sort of two different solutions, right? A base scenario that included and was a requirement to submit a base scenario that included the preservation of the building. Alternately, in the RFP, developers were also allowed to present an alternate scenario, and some of the proposers did that. And the alternate scenario considered what the site might look like if the building was removed from consideration or was removed from the site. As a third um, priority goal, we wanted to have a significant component of commercial. It could be office or lab or hotel or retail. You know, the developers, we, we really wanted to look to them to tell us what they thought could happen in the market and what was feasible with a floor of 250,000 square feet. Additionally, one of our other goals was to create you know, a signature development on this four acre site, utilizing best practices in urban design, creating an activated street level experience and really creating a transformative project on this four acre site. Next, uh, we had a new goal, which was to really celebrate the cultural heritage of Durham, in particular, the Haytai legacy and the West End and what that means for our community, and to try to elevate that as a part of the programming and activities that were happening and the design of, of the site and the proposal. And last, we wanted to have revenue generation over the long term, including production of tax revenue as a part of the on-site development. As a reminder, we had also uh, rezoned this parcel. So there is an approved development plan for this parcel. Uh, in that approved development plan, it requires a minimum of 280 uh, residential units um, of affordable housing and 250 to 450,000 square feet of commercial space as the floor. Additionally, um, council priorities in the downtown design districts, which are, are baked into the planning department's work, uh, also require additionally um, housing units green space and pedestrian friendly infrastructure as a part of the design. So all of these goals and this development plan are working together and the proposals that we received, and we will go through and, and outline for you in, in the proposals, um, which we feel like 
met those all six goals where some of them were more uh, advantageous than others, where some really shown. Um, I also want to mention that um, we, you received a priority memo uh, that had financial information in it. So I wanted to say that the memo that we, you had originally received was correct and accurate and the financial updates that you received. Um, so the what has been public uh, and online that we had been had, had publicly available since June uh, was our accurate information. And then recently we have looked at, as we've been having conversations with bond council, whether the, the, the rates that we use in our models were appropriate. And as we've talked about what kind of bond we might issue, we moved and we've, we've modified those numbers. So we will present both of those numbers, sets of numbers to you today, um, moving from a consideration of a taxable to non-taxable bond and using a 6% interest rate, which we think is more appropriate for the market today. Um, obviously conditions will continue to change as this, as this project moves forward and we will adapt as necessary in our financial modeling. So with that, I wanted to just bring um, Mark Kirachi up here. He's with HRNA Advisors, and he's been a partner with us and doing a lot of the financial analysis. So he's going to present the rest of the process. Uh, good afternoon, um, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, City Manager, Council Members. Uh, pleasure to be speaking with you today. Uh, so just as a reminder of, of who's been, who responded to these proposals. We, uh, back in November, we qualified six developers to continue on in this process. Three developers submitted responses um, with ultimately five proposals. Uh, Ackridge submitted the base scenario proposal. Conifer submitted both the base and the alternative and the People's Corporation submitted both the base and the alternative. And we'll be going through all of those today with some detail. Um, First, just to set the stage in terms of the different proposals that were submitted, starting with Ackridge. Uh, this was primarily a residential proposal, 225 market residential units, alongside 101 units at 60% AMI or below. In terms of their commercial program, they had 3,000 square feet of retail with no other components of office, lab, or hotel, which were available uses that developers could propose upon as part of their commercial program. In addition, uh, they proposed pop-up retail space as part of their open space activation program. And they set aside art and community spaces uh, as part of the, the physical layout of their program without specifying specific square footage. We received two proposals from Conifer, as I mentioned. Um, there's a base and alternative scenario. Many of the changes are physical in terms of how the site is laid out, um, but there are small differences in the program. And so you can see um, 156 units of market residential in the base to 146 in the alternative. A little bit of a differentiation in the affordable program, 81 units at 60% AMI, which would be considered advantageous based on the RFP uh, criteria that we set back in November. And uh, a slight difference in, they also provided units at 80 to 100% AMI. And those, you know, the unit counts are slightly different. So not under the 60% threshold, but still rent restricted units that, you know, I think provide additional affordable units to the community. And then in total, about 150,000 square feet of commercial space. Again, small differences between office and retail between the two programs, uh, but ultimately 150,000 square feet. Uh, and the, in their proposal, they suggested that the office would be medical office. One of the pieces that we of information we received in the interviews is that they were not necessarily tied to the medical office program, uh, but there would be uh, just generally speaking, commercial office available as part of their uh, proposed development program. And then additionally, 13 to 16,000 feet of community space between the two alternatives. And then the People's Corporation, uh, total uh, 288 units of, of market rate housing. About 90% of that is for rent. About 10% of that is for sale. So condominium units within the broader residential program. 92 units at 60% AMI or below, which crosses the highly advantageous threshold that we set in the RFP uh, in November. And then um, a slight, slight changes in their overall commercial program uh, in their base program. It comes out at about 255,000 square feet of commercial space in their alternative program. It rounds out to be just about 250,000, but meeting the 250,000 uh, square foot threshold. Um, one of the main differences is in the base proposal where they maintain the Milton small building, they propose a hotel as part of that rehabilitation. In their alternative, when they remove the building, the, the foundational proposal that they submitted has a community center slash museum as one of the critical components of their program. Uh, there's some variation there. We'll talk about that as we go along. Okay, there we go. 
So I'm not gonna go into too much detail here, but this is the scoring that the evaluation committee settled on. The dark green HA, that suggests the highly advantageous. Lighter green A is advantageous. And then the gray not advantageous is NA. And then in the two boxes, they're not applicable where the historic preservation was not relevant to the proposal. As we go through the descriptions of each of these submissions, um, we can sort of talk about why each of these were scored the way that they were, but ultimately these are recommendations that were affirmed by the evaluation committee back in June. And so as we go into each proposal before, I wanna use uh, this as, as sort of a, a template for how we go through this conversation. So as Stacy mentioned, um, these were the terms and they were accurate when they were posted back in July. In further consultation with city finance, we've made some adjustments in terms of how we've, we've calculated some of these. And so for each, you'll see what's been posted publicly and then the refinements that have been made. As I walk through each of these terms, we're gonna talk about some of the changes that have made so everyone's on the same page about what the changes have been. But before I even do that, I wanna go through and talk about, we have three developers, they all propose different financial terms and there are different types of terms. And so I just wanna you know, set, set a level ground here on what we're talking about. Um, there have been uh, some of the developers propose an upfront payment, which is part of the transfer of land. Uh, so in, in these scenarios, you would have uh, the land being eventually owned by the developer. The city would sell the land to the developer and they would own it outright. For ongoing rent payments, we had Conifer suggest that the city would continue to own the land, but then lease improvements to the developer. And in that sense, there'd be a ground lease scenario where ground rent payments would come back to the city over time. So in this case, it's not relevant to Anchorage because they did not have a ground lease structure. In some uh, cases, we have direct subsidies, cash subsidies to developers to support development. We'll talk about those when they're relevant. Uh, between loan payments to the city and the limited obligation bond payments, here's where we have to sort of address some of the changes that have been made. Uh, so previously we made an assumption and this was initially in consultation with city finance. We felt at that time that a tax exempt bond at 4% interest was an appropriate way to model the different loan types and, and offers that we saw across the developers. Each developer proposed different principles, terms, interest rates. So to level set and think about the opportunity cost of the city's money, we wanted to use one normalizing structure to understand how the city benefits or, or um, suffers in some way as a result of that structure. And so one of the major changes that we've made in going from that 4% tax exempt bond, we've now moved to a 6% taxable bond. And so this is in part, again, to sort of align with typical precedents and also to align with some of the baseline expectations of the local government commission in terms of their best practices in cities issuing debt. Another important change is that we modeled this initially as an amortizing loan. So interest paid back first and the principal increases over time. Um, one of the changes that the local government commission asked us to make was to align this with their best practices, which would be level principal repayment. So there are higher payments up front as the interest comes down, as the principal declines, um, those payments decrease over time. So effectively the city would, would minim minimize their risk in this way with more payment taking place up front. There's a capital event proceeds line, which will only be relevant to the People's Corporation. So I'll talk about that when we get there. And then we have a line for gross tax revenue. And this is uh, specifically property tax, real, pro sorry, real property tax, personal property tax, and sales tax. Um, which we've had slight adjustments to um, with some of the adjustments to the property tax um, uh, uh, millage that has been applied. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then finally, you see gross cash value. This is purely dollars and cents coming in and out based on our projections. And then the net present value is the value to the city over time, valuing present money over future money. We're generally discounting this at 6.5% over 20 years with one modification that we'll talk about um, as we get to people's one that's very specific to them. So now that we've gotten all the technical stuff out of the way, let's go into the actual terms from Accridge. Uh, so an upfront payment of $4.5 million, um, no ongoing rent, no subsidies. Um, they offered a $6.3 million loan paid back over 20 years at 1% interest only. And so because they're only paying 1% back, the city is then obligated to close the gap between the 1% and the 6% to bondholders, as well as the debt capacity. Uh, so that would require that the city pay more than they received back as part of the loan. So that's ultimately- So, so that, that's the 10.3 payments, right? Right, that, that's right. the payments that the city has to issue out. On the, on the, on the limited obligation bond. Right. Which is, a, which is not, it's, it's a 
non-tax exempt. So yes, exactly. Yes. And then uh, overall, about $11 million in gross tax revenue. Uh, overall gross tax participation, or sorry, gross cash value participation is $13 million with a net present value of 6.5. Okay. So now that we've gone through all this, as we go through the individual offers from the developers, I think this will go much, much quicker. So just quickly to sort of orient you to the proposal, we have a few of these slides here that are just meant to give visual representation to what developers propose. You see the Milton Small Building off to the right. That is a that is one of their affordable housing um, developments. They have two of them on their campus comprising the 101 total affordable housing units and then the market rate residential building. In the center, you can see their open space layout, some of the pop-up retail that they discussed, as well as some of the overall programming to activate the space. Quickly to walk through strengths and weaknesses and risks of each of these proposals, starting with Ackridge. Um, compared Ackridge to the other developers, smaller financial expectations upfront from the city. Uh, so you know, less capital that the city needs to issue upfront. They deliver 101 rent restricted units at 60% AMI or below. So this is one, the highest number, but two, considered to be highly advantageous given the criteria. They preserve the building and they also provide art gallery and community spaces uh, as a part of their physical development. They do not offer really any commercial program besides that 3,000 square feet of physical retail. They do have the pop-up retail, but again, not part of the physical program. Given the site entitlements that are currently in place, this underutilizes what the city has sort of deemed to be the appropriate potential for the site. Um, and though they have a, a sort of an approach to placemaking, they do not really specify how it, it sort of pays homage to the Haytai community. And so, you know, we thought that uh, there wasn't really a, a a sense of, of um, how that community was being incorporated into the vision for the site. In terms of risks, uh, one thing that I want to point out, so uh, low-income housing tax credits, uh, each of the developers rely on some form of low-income housing tax credit. In this case, Ackridge is relying on two 9% awards. I think one of the main differences there is a 9% award and a 4% award. One of the main uh, components of the 9% award is that it's competitive. And so developers will have to compete a, against other projects locally to potentially receive those awards. If they compete against other projects and do not receive them, and it's critical to fund the project, that could lead to project delays. And so the reliance on two separate 9% line tech awards creates a certain amount of risk. So we want to highlight that. Um, one of the drawbacks, I think, going back to that sixth priority was the city's potential participation in the site long term. That doesn't take place here. And then for each of these developers, they offer city loans, I mentioned this before. Uh, what I didn't mention before is that they're all in a subordinate position. And so you'll see there's risk consistently between um, each developer proposal that ultimately the city doesn't would not have recourse. There would be a primary lender that would have recourse over the land. And so that's something that when the city thinks about issuing debt, it should be aware of. Great. So now moving to Conifer. They have a base and alternative proposal. They're very similar. So I'll move through the alternative much quicker than I moved through the base. Uh, but so upfront, Conifer, so these are the numbers that have been, oh, sorry. Oh, these are the numbers that have been posted online publicly. And these are our updated numbers. And so as part of the financial terms, they offer a 65 year ground lease. This is where you see the ongoing rent payments of roughly $52,000 per year. They do not escalate as a result of inflation. And they do not escalate with any sort of site performance. So if the site does particularly well, the city doesn't benefit from that. It's just an ongoing rent payment of the 65 year term. Uh, they do not ask for subsidies. They do ask for in, in this proposal, a $33 million 20 year term loan at 1% interest only. So again, that same Delta of who carries the debt, a lot of that falls on the city. And you see the Delta between what the city is receives and then ultimately what the city has to pay out. So that's a subsidy that the city has to bear. Uh, the $17 million in gross tax revenue to the city ultimately contributes to $4.4 million in gross cash value. But when we adjust for the cost of time, ultimately the net present value is a negative $9 million. Again, just a little bit of the site here, you see um, the Milton small building off to the right. And this is again, affordable residential. Um, I think that's the residential building towards the back. Um, and you can see some of their open space orientation here. Uh, so quickly, the strengths, weaknesses, and risks are effectively the same between the base and the alternative. So I just want to highlight that this applies to both. 
Um, 81 rent restricted units, which is considered to be advantageous based on how it's laid out, uh, laid, sorry, forgive me, laid out within the proposals and within the RFP. 45 additional rent restricted units, not below the 60% threshold, but still uh, you know, setting aside rent restricted units for the city and for the community. They preserve the building and they include 150,000 square feet of commercial alongside the ground lease payments over time. They do not fully utilize the site development potential. They do not necessarily speak to the Haytown community really in any way. I don't even think they mentioned it in their proposal, the community in particular. And one thing that came up, uh, it's not clearly evident in their proposal, but we learned this during the interview session is that they are proposing to build a new street through the middle of the site. Uh, which the evaluation com committee considered to be uh, not a strength, so ultimately a weakness of their proposal, um, how it may disrupt ultimately site orientation. Because it's a 1% loan, uh, and, and again, a city loan in a subordinate position, we want to highlight that ultimate risk. They also rely on a 9% LIHTC award, so the same competitive risk also applies there. And then we also want to point out that um, in evaluating some of the qualifications that they submitted, they did not have the same kind of large scale mixed use development experience, specifically commercial development in a mixed use environment similar to Durham. And so that uh, I don't wanna suggest that they're not capable of doing this. I think that without that experience, it's possible that if they were to be chosen as the developer, that could potentially lead to delays, cost overruns, things that weren't projected because they just haven't done this type of work before. So then quickly, the comment for alternative, uh, I think this, this image actually does a great job of showing the main difference in the site. This is their office building. They initially had this in the back of the site, so towards the southeastern corner. Uh, with the Milton Small removed, they move it to the northeastern corner and then distribute residential across the site. Uh, the terms in their uh, overall structure are, are generally the same. Small changes, the rent payments increase slightly, so a little bit more rent to the city over time. The loan becomes smaller at $22 million. Um, the, but the terms are the same, 1% over 20 years, and an interest only. So again, the city has to make up the delta. Oh, sorry, forgive me. Yes, right, that was the public slide. So this is these are the updated numbers. Um, and then you can see the gross tax revenue there. So over time, the gross cash value to the city is roughly $12 million, but the net present value is negative 1.6 million. Right. This shows you, again, the orientation of the open space and shows the office building up in the corner here. And then I won't walk through the strengths, weaknesses, and risks again, because again, they're very much the same as um, the base proposal. And so moving into Peebles and their base proposal. So just, I think this is again, a good picture to sort of spell out the site orientation. You have the rehabilitated Milton Small building as a hotel up front. Towards the back right corner, you can see the mixed income residential building comprising for sale and um, for rent units, again, both market rate and affordable, and then a lab office building towards the back with a significant amount of retail. To walk through, oh, so this is initially what was publicly available in July, and as we've made updates, this is what uh, our, our numbers have currently settled upon. So Peebles in their base proposal offers a seven and a half million upfront payment because it's a transfer of property, there are no ongoing rent payments, so not a ground lease as it's currently offered. They are asking for $3.8 million in direct subsidy to support the hotel uh, rehabilitation, so the Milton Small rehabilitation. They offer, in their loan terms, they offer 6%. Uh, so the ultimate delta between what they pay back to the city overall with their um, interest payments and what the limited bond obligation expects, that delta is, is you know, positive for the city. So on the capital event, and this is where I want to speak to this, one of the changes that we've made from um, in how we've modeled it is not evident on the screen because we're displaying the cash value, but in how we've modeled this, because this is, this is ultimately contingent on the net proceeds from the sale of the site. Uh, in their proposal, they suggested that they would sell the site by year 10. And so in that closing, based on their projections, should the site do well, the city would receive 40% of the net proceeds from that sale. One thing that we've done to change is I mentioned before that um, there was a 6.5% discount rate across the project. We wanted to adjust for the contingency here because the site success is not something that the city can guarantee nor can people's guarantee. And so we wanted to place a more conservative discount rate upon there. And so that is now weighed at a 10% rate over time. 
So it's further discounted in the net present value, the final number below at 22.6 million. Ultimately, altogether, um, gross cash is 48.3 million and the net present value is 22.6 million. Again, um, the site orientation, uh, just to give you a sense of how the buildings work together, you can see the, you know, sort of the open space component. When we get to the alternative, I'll speak a little bit more to the um, individual placemaking pieces that are there because those are consistent between the two proposals. Uh, but ultimately they very much addressed um, and, and did a lot of engagement upfront um, to engage with folks across the community to understand what some of these placemaking elements could look like. Um, and actually, you know, this proposal in some way, shape or form, it was, was as sort of defined as it was in the RFP, they did that in the RFQ stage. So the city was able to understand what some of the um, site layout components would be very early on. And so quickly to walk through the strengths, the weaknesses and the risks, 92 rent restricted units at 60% AMI or below, which clears the highly advantageous threshold. They meet the expectations around the commercial development at 250,000 square feet of commercial space. They leverage 4% LIHTC as opposed to the nine. So this is a not, they don't rely on the competitive housing tax credit. And this is one that they can apply for. And as long as it matches the expectations, they would receive funding. Uh, I talked a little bit about the open space, but significant commitments to overall open space and design to make a signature site. And uh, by virtue of that capital event, they do allow the city to participate in site success at the sale. One of the direct weaknesses is that, again, that $3.8 million subsidy that the city would have to give out upfront, along with the risk of the city loan and subordinate position, which I, I didn't mention, and forgive me, I didn't mention this the first time through, the size of the loan is $57 million. So of the three loans that we've discussed, or sorry, the five loans that we've discussed across the three proposals, um, this is one of the larger um, in terms of scale. And then ultimately, like the, how the city participates in the success of the site is limited, is contingent upon the site success. One other thing we just want to point out as a risk, um, one of the conversations, or I, we had a few conversations, I should say, with developers across the triangle to test some of the costs that we saw, uh, not just with Peebles, but with other developers as well. And one of the questions that was brought up was with their expectations around construction for lab space, what we heard from developers was that this um, accounted for some of the hard cost construction and soft cost construction for the shell of the building, but tenant improvements weren't included in those costs, at least from their, their opinion. We heard from their um, construction contractor as a part of their team that these are very much in line with triangle estimates. So just to be upfront, I, you know, we've heard two different stories on this and you know, I think sort of leave it to you to uh, parse through those differences. So that completes the base proposal and now moving into the alternative. Many similarities, so I will move faster. Um, I will go back actually to start. So up front, you see, you know, right off the bat, the major difference is this community center that sits in front. The hotel has been removed, the small building has been removed. Um, and it is a combination of a community center and a museum space. And on the and on the top floor is a green space, at least that's how it's represented in the designs. And so this is what ultimately replaces that commercial use. Um, there are components to this that you know I think are worth understanding because there's a little bit of optionality for the city. What they have suggested is that the city can, if they were to choose this proposal, swap out the community center museum for a revenue generating use, um, which upon further conversation, it, it's not, by no means are they sort of suggesting one direct path, but I think the immediate suggestion was in potentially mixed use, or sorry, mixed income housing. So additional mixed income housing as part of the development. So to walk through their deal terms, uh, with the removal of the hotel and the addition of the community center, that removes the upfront payment from their base proposal. They are still requesting the 3.8, oh, thank you, yes. They're still requesting the $3.8 million in subsidies. Um, the loan terms are the same, though the loan is slightly higher. I believe it's closer to $60 million for the alternative scenario. Uh, and, and, but again, all the oblig limited obligation bond structural components are the same. The capital event is slightly larger here in terms of the overall success of the site and then the proceeds that the city takes. And then the gross tax revenue comes out to be about $36 million. Overall, gross cash value is $45.3 million, and the net present value is $17 million. And again, so you can see one more perspective on the community center space, the green space on the roof. And then also, this is where you get a little bit more of the sense of what's happening in between the buildings. Um, I've, there are 
there are specific names that are associated. There's a cultural walk, there's a you know, central green, all these sort of individual programming pieces that comprise the larger open space component, including a very sort of engaging and activating uh, commitment to the Haytai community. One of the commitments that Peoples makes in their proposal and they reiterated during their interviews is that they would continue to engage the community to refine these concepts. And so uh, this is very much something that they took an initial um, swipe at thinking about what uh, what open, the commitments of the Haytai community would look like, but very much open to you know further discussion with the community. And many of the strengths and weaknesses are the same. I'll highlight the ones that are different. I mentioned the replacement of the cultural center with a revenue generating use. That would change the upfront payment from zero to $5 million should the city pursue that path. Um, ultimately, around the cultural center, it was unclear to us who would pay for those operations, where the revenues would come from. So as sort of a base component of the proposal, sort of uncertain on, on the revenues and costs of how that center gets run, who the tenant is for the museum, et cetera. And, and you know, within their foundational proposal with the community center, again, zero upfront payment uh, as compared to their base proposal. Otherwise, the risks are relatively the same. So just to quickly summarize what we've talked about today. So this was, again, this, this is the summary comparison that you've seen publicly. And this is as it's represented now, based on the adjustments that we've made. And just to rehash on what the program is, I won't go through the details, but again, comparing the net present value between respondents. The scores, again, and I think, you know, as we sort of talk through all the different components, we can absolutely dive in deeper as to why the evaluation committee sort of affirmed these scores as they did. Comparing financial terms, again, gross cash versus net present value and all the different components and how they're represented on the cash basis. Oh, sorry, and that was the public version. So this is the up-to-date version. And then tax revenue projections over 20 years. This is the, has been the public version. The only change we made here is that we updated the property tax rate so the calculations are a little bit different. And then, uh, so this is the last slide we have. I just wanna add one other component of our sort of analysis and review. We conducted a couple of reference checks with um, other cities and public organizations that the People's Corporation has worked with. And it, as part of the recommendation, we wanted to make sure that we had perspectives from other organizations, much like the city of Durham, who have wanted to see their real estate aspirations come to bear. And um, we spoke with the with Mecklenburg County, uh, Mech, Mecklenburg County in North Carolina. We also spoke with the Massachusetts Bay Transit Authority in in Boston. And generally speaking, the People's Corporation received glowing commentary. Uh, they've been receptive. They've been reliable. They've been accessible. Uh, one of the things that's been constantly sort of spoken to is how uh, when. Specifically, uh, Donahue, um, when he needs to be on site for a meeting, he's there. He jumps on a plane. He gets there as quickly as he needs to. Um, they are regularly engaging the community. And I think especially in the Massachusetts Bay example, they have executed or sorry, they're planning on executing um, very technically difficult projects, building over highways, building over transit stations, building over technically very difficult um, projects from a real estate perspective. And they've planned accordingly, and the, the organizations have been thrilled with how they've planned for that. Now, um, in terms of some of the more constructive feedback we've received, there's been some question about you know, how quickly they've moved. The only, and I wanna point out that that constructive feedback was immediately qualified by COVID slowed things down. County governments, transit agencies, bureaucracy has slowed them down. And in addition to that, because they're so intentional about conducting community engagement and getting people on board and building buy-in within the community, they would defer to doing that before rushing something forward without community buy-in. And so while they offer that feedback, they also were quick to acknowledge that ultimately Peoples has been an excellent partner for them. Uh, they've been malleable. They've approached understanding, they've understood the market conditions. They've proposed solutions that work for the organizations and their goals and have been a valued partner. And so uh, happy to answer any more questions about that and really any other components of the presentation. And with that, I think unless there's anything else, we can go to questions. Thank you so much. Colleagues, about it. Citizen comments, do they come later or? 
or is that or are there going to be citizen comments or is that is that only at the meeting on Monday? citizen comments yeah Actually, I'll go with the residents first. Sorry about okay. that. Yeah, no All right, first up, I have Rick Larson. And right after Rick would be um, Mick Rayner. Mr. Mayor, uh, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Madam Manager, members of council, thanks for the opportunity to um, to talk about uh, this uh, issue with you. Um, I'm Rick Larson, I'm the co-chair of the Durham CAN Affordable Housing Action Team. And I speak on behalf of a consortium of six organizations, uh, Durham CAN, the Coalition for Affordable Housing and Transit, Durham uh, Committee on the Affairs of Black People, People's Alliance, Duke Memorial United Methodist Church, and the Durham NAACP. Um, we're sorry that Walter Jackson and Stella Adams and Dr. Birch um, from the Durham Committee and NAACP couldn't be with us here today due to health and travel and weather issues, uh, but they've been active members of our consortium, but we do have representatives from a number of the um, members of our consortium here, and we have a few requests uh, to make of you at this point in the process. Um, affordable housing is one, and um, so I'll get us started on that. Um, We've been advocating with you and with city staff uh, for community needs at 505 for, for many months. Um, and that's because 505, as you all know, is a rare opportunity. We've got a public entity, the city of Durham, where you can dictate how to address an urgent public need, which is the lack of affordable workforce housing in Durham on a precious publicly owned piece of land. So public, public, public. And it makes sense that council made affordable housing its number one priority. Um, you now have proposals from two developers, Ackridge and Peebles, that meet the threshold of affordable housing, earning them a highly advantageous grade, basically an A, right, on the report card that the city staff is using. In fact, we think um, they deserve a grade of pass rather than a grade of A. After all, they've really only met the minimum of affordable housing units that um, are in the report card, and we think Durham deserves better. Our six community organizations ask that you as council members direct staff in the negotiation process with the developer to earn an A, a true A, on this report card by building substantially more affordable housing and market rate units in mixed income buildings. Um, as you well know, this isn't just a classroom exercise. Every additional unit of affordable housing means that one more working family in Durham can live affordably and buy groceries, services, uh, rather than in Burlington or Roxborough, which is where many working families have to locate now for housing costs. This is well worth it for all of us, we think, um, even if it means a fewer square feet of lab space, which is um, part of the people's proposal. And with my CAN hat on, uh, Durham CAN, I want to say we appreciate the commitment that many of you um, as candidates made in October to Durham CAN to choose the developer who will build the most affordable units at 505. This is your moment, obviously, to make good on that commitment. And Peebles proposes 92 units, Ackridge is proposing 101. So uh, from our perspective, if you choose to negotiate with Peebles, making good on your commitment to CAN, um, will mean increasing that number above 101 <laughs> units and our community organizations hope that you'll negotiate a significant, you. significantly higher number. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, I have Mick Rayner. Thank you. Thank you all for your time. Uh, I'm one of the pastors. My name is Mick Rayner. I'm one of the pastors at Duke Memorial uh, across the street from the 505 project and a member of the Durham Can Clergy Caucus. Uh, in my role as a pastor, I meet with folks literally every week in need of rent assistance. Last year, we as a church helped 35 families with rent. Through just July of this year, we have had over 100 people apply for rent assistance to our church. We've been able to help 50 of them. Many of the people we help, you might not expect. A recent college graduate who lives with multiple roommates, a nurse in the West End struggling to cover a security deposit plus a month's rent. I meet my share of folks in their lowest moments. 
but I also meet many at the start of their journey. Folks like myself who fall in love with Durham, find a job in downtown, but cannot afford to live there. Last October, I sat with folks from my church and many other congregations of Durham Can, as you pledged, many of you pledged, to support a developer who, built, who helps build the most affordable housing at the 505 site. We're counting on you to fulfill those commitments you made last fall. The proposals the city has received, we believe, do the minimum to address the need for housing, affordable housing for Durham's working folk. It seems clear to me that we can do better and we should do better. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I have Jane Williams. And after Jane, Mayor Gully. Thank you, council members, for your time. I'm Jane Williams, and I represent the Coalition of Affordable Housing and Transit in Durham. It is rare when six of Durham's most socially, economically, and racially diverse groups come together to support an issue. And I'd like to reiterate who those organizations are. CAN, the Durham Committee for the Affairs of Black People, People's Alliance, the Coalition for Affordable Housing and Transit, the Durham NAACP, and Duke Memorial Methodist Church. We are united in our, our support of su a substantial number of affordable housing apartments at 505 West Chapel Hill. From my personal experience, I know that the need is great. I volunteer at the walk-in ministry of First Presbyterian Church where we twice weekly speak to those who are suffering from a lack of affordable housing. The 505 property is the city's last opportunity to directly address the housing shortage. We are also united in our belief that the land should remain in city hands. To ensure that the land is used for affordable housing, we strongly support the city retaining ownership of the property, no matter who becomes the developer. If the property is sold, the city of Durham will have no say in its use. We would encourage a 50 to 99 year lease to ensure that affordable housing remains a reality for Durham's workforce. A ground lease is a viable way for the city to earn steady revenue and is consistent with preserving affordable housing units in perpetuity. We ask council to direct the city manager to negotiate with the developer to lease, not own the property. Thank you. Thank you. Are we going? Thank you, members of council. Good afternoon, Madam Manager. It's good to be with you. Thank you for this opportunity to uh, add a few comments, although it's hard for me to add much to what's already been said. I do. I told Walter Jackson that I would say that he really would love to have been here and travel kept him away. Um, it, we're back at a sort of a key decision point, aren't we, with this property that uh, you all and your predecessor councils have wrestled with for years, five, six years at least. We've been working on this, uh, but a key point and I think that uh, you've heard our message. Our groups have talked about this since the proposals came in. And our assessment was that um, despite an unfortunately flawed uh, RFP process, uh, we had three proposals, uh, three developers come forward with their proposal, a total of five proposals. Um, and the question is, is there a proposal we can go with? And I think all of our judgment was, we can't tell yet. Uh, there was proposals from at least two of the developers we felt like had promise. Um, and as the uh, city staff has focused on people's, our comments and work will focus and our comments today focus on them as well. And our thought was people's has done some good things, interesting things in the proposal, but we wanted to see significantly more housing units and significantly more affordable housing units as a part of their proposal. And we wanted to see the land leased not purchased from the city. 
Um, I have good news in that regard. Uh, what you heard about Donahue Peebles doing a good job working with community folks has been true in our experience. He's reached out to us. We've had a couple of meetings. He and I've talked several times in addition to that. And when I raised these issues with him, said, you know, we want to see the city retain the land and just lease it. He said, we work with developments everywhere doing it one way or the other. We can do either one. When I said uh, we want to see significantly more affordable housing units and significantly more uh, residential housing units, period, uh, not just one or two more or whatever, uh, he said, uh, we can do that. He said, if the council directs us to do that, we will do that. Our proposals initially were in response to the RFP that came forward. But if that's what council would like to see as an improvement on the, where we are now, we can do that. Uh, so I think that is good and hopeful news uh, for what may happen as we go forward. Last two things just to raise the council, less affordable housing, more just for the council, because I've enjoyed the opportunity to sit where you sit um, about working. One of them uh, of the concerns comes from people's performance in other communities. And we're appreciative that uh, despite uh, initial report from staff that wasn't discussed, that I understand it's been raised uh, with the consultant. You heard the consultant respond to a couple of communities, Boston and uh, Charlotte. Uh, we've also uh, heard concerns raised about in the District of Columbia, a public-private partnership with the district. Um, we're, we're not going to pretend that we know what's going on there or that we know how to assess that. But I'll tell you what, council's got to do that. That's a part of your all's due diligence when you sit down with the partners to make sure you know what's going on. And there may be, well, good answers for all of that, uh, but you, you all mayor. need to find it. I can add one more thing. You, you put me in a tough spot because I'm a mayor cutting a mayor off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the huge loan money is concerns us as well, and you all have to make sure we're Thank you. taxpayer dollars are safe. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, and I have one person online, uh, Jane Williams, unless there's another one. You sign up online, any person? Okay. So I have Julianne Patterson. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Oh, loud and clear. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, so Julianne Patterson, um, and I'm the Executive Director of Preservation Durham. I really wanted to join you all in person today, but the weather related school closures have me home with my son. So I appreciate the opportunity to virtually express Preservation Durham's enthusiastic support to move forward with the People's Corporation, um, specifically to realize their base proposal plan that includes the adaptive, adaptive reuse of the historic home security life insurance, Milton Small Building into a hotel. Um, we've had great conversations with the people's team so far and feel that they address the stated goals in the RFP and that they really understand the cultural and financial value of retaining and reusing the existing building. Um, we believe their overall site plan enhances the existing building and is designed to engage the community through mixed use activation of the entire site. And I can also attest to the earlier remarks that they've already invested in upfront community engagement to design a signature placemaking plan. Um, but we also know as your conversations and negotiations continue to develop, um, the plan may evolve. Um, and so I just wanna continue to emphasize the importance of retaining and preserving the existing building. Um, I think we all saw through the comparison of alternative proposals that a clean slate on the site doesn't magically provide more affordable housing units, capture significant revenue gains or meet any new goals. Um, so the historic building isn't the issue, in fact, the rehab of the historic building offers financial incentives that can help close the financing gap and reduce the amount of public financing needed. The combined federal and state historic tax credits allow up to 35% of the estimated $16 million adaptive reuse cost to be covered through the credit, um, which is actually worth more than the 3.8 million subsidy requested from the city to adapt the building into a hotel. Um, and unlike LIHTC and similar programs, these credits aren't competitive. The building just needs to be listed on the National Register of Historic Places. And Preservation Durham started this process back in 2017, um, and the building is eligible. Um, so the renovation plans would just need to be reviewed and certified by the State Historic Preservation Office. And Durham has a successful track record of using these historic tax credits for the adaptive reuse of buildings into a hotel. So the 21C and the unscripted downtown are two examples. Um, I won't disagree with other comments that encourage you to look at ways to add more affordable housing to the site, but I think the People's Corporation can get you there while also keeping the historic building. 
Um, Preservation Durham listed this building on our Places in Peril list back in 2014. So for the last decade, we've been watching and advocating for its preservation along with the community. And I know many of you um, and city staff have been along the way too. So I want to say thank you to Stacey Poston and Tara Nichols who have been more than patient <laughs> with my barrage of questions and requests for updates. And I just want to close my comments by saying Preservation Durham, we're excited and optimistic to see a uh, people's base proposal come to fruition and finally see some development on this site. So thank you for the time. <clears throat> thank you so much. Thank you. Those are all of the speakers I have signed up. At this time, I'll bring it back before the council for any questions, comments. And, and Madam uh, Attorney, before we get started, is this is this an appropriate time to, I guess we can sort of state concerns or ask questions or whatever. Is it an appropriate time for any negotiation I mean, I think you're going to want to have the staff negotiate, right? You, right. But you can certainly express preferences that the council has to make modifications in what's been presented to you today. Sounds good. This is not. I, I hope we're not in, in a mediation. Let's not do that. Okay. Good. 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 No, you're good. Just trying to stay away from anything that may be quid pro quo and all that stuff. All right, yeah. Council Member Ritz. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, and are these questions for Mark or for Mr. Peoples? I don't know who would like, so let me, do, I'll just start by saying, people, I love the vision of Peoples. Um, and as Ms. Patterson just said, I love the, I love the renovation of the Milton Small Building. I think that's a, I think it's a classic piece of modernist ar architecture that we do well to save in Durham. So I love that piece of it. I love the connection of the community, the place making pieces, but I do have, I do have a number of concerns. One is, as folks have mentioned here, like, I'm, I think I'm we, sorry, I'm sorry, Councilman Ruth. Yeah. Let's. Let me we, stop you right there. Let's take a five minute. Okay, I, five. I really want a full council here. And okay. I know those folks are getting up going to the restroom. So let's just take a five minute break okay. uh, so I can have everybody here. All right, everyone, it's 3.04. I'll see you back at 3.05. I'll see you back at 3.10. Let's do it. Let's do it. Council Member Ruth, back yeah, again, Thank you. Yeah. So again, love the vision. And not only the vision, the saving the building, but also the mixed use concept. Really good, right? I do have some concerns. I share with some of the comments or concerns some of the residents made about limited affordable housing. I'd love to see more housing, more affordable on this site, number one. Um, and I think by by setting the way we set the RFP, I think they delivered the RFP, but I, I agree with some of the folks who said like, that's kind of passing grade. It's not really, not hitting out of the park for me. Second thing is like, I really am convinced we need to keep the land and not sell the land. Um, so I'll just put that out there. I do have some questions for HRNA. So I know we emailed about this idea of like risk, right? Clearly people's is a big, bigger vision, right? Bigger project but also brings much more risk into the equation for the city. So I'm wondering, in addition, I mean, you did a good job of listing some of the sort of pros and cons. I think in the manager's memo, there was some identification of sort of different risk factors, including the, you mentioned the lab space costs. Is that is that accurate? The capital event, right? The sort of the, the loan payments. But I'm just wondering if you did any kind of like modeling or like, did you discount the net present value based on, you know, some kind of risk calculation? Because I think in some ways, like just listing them is great but giving us a better sense as we make decisions, like how do we think about that risk factoring into our decisions? Right, so internally, in terms of our own modeling, one of the things that we applied was, um, I mentioned a little bit about this in, in the presentation, we wanted to think about what was contingent and non-contingent. From our standpoint, if they offer a direct upfront payment, that's non-contingent because that's a deal term, right? Same thing with the loans. The only thing that we could really interpret to be non-contingent, or sorry, contingent, would be the capital event, and that was the 2.7 million in the base proposal and the 6 million in the alternative proposal that was tied to the net proceeds of the sale, all determined by the success of the site. So we use a different discount rate that's in line with you know some commercial real estate standards for capitalization, uh, which is really just one of a, a key metric that gets used in selling a site. So we wanted to align that, the discount rate with that sort of market standard to evaluate how that impacts. Now, ultimately it's a small number in the grand scheme of the, the, the value of the property and the other numbers that we're evaluating. But so that was one way in which we, we wanted to approach risk. Um, I mean, there are, and so there's the sort of the financial components and you mentioned a lot of the tangible components and, or sorry, intangible components around um, 
you know, we're talking about a loan that is a subordinate loan, so the city doesn't have the recourse, and you know, that's, and it, we're also talking about a large loan, right? The city has to develop the capital or right. set aside. Those yeah. loan payments are also at some level contingent on the success of the project, right? So that is a contingency. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. it's it's contingent in the sense that, you know, but that yes, they need capital cash flow to pay the payments back, but that would be true for all the developers, right? And there's a different components here. There's the market right. rate residential which is part of the mixed use building, which in my understanding is the first phase of their development. And of all the you know, questions around overall feasibility, I think the largest question is around the office and lab space based on everything post COVID work from home trend, et cetera, which is the third phase of their development as far as I understand it. So there's a little bit more time for the city to think about what that plot becomes or what that part of the site becomes. And it's worth saying that in the conversations that I had with the Massachusetts Bay uh, Transit Authority, they talked about the constant sort of push and pull that they are working in their relationship with Peebles, how they're thinking about shifting the program. Boston has a different kind of lab market. There's been a lot of development in Boston over the last 10 to 15 years, oversaturation. And so they're you know, slowly condensing the program, they're increasing the lab program, they're increasing the residential program in response to that, which I think creates the kind of relationship that ultimately the city would want to have with a developer, having that flexibility to respond to market trends and develop something that can be successful. And so while I think in any development program, all the development programs we looked at, there's risk. You, it's a tens of hundreds of millions of dollars of investment, but is there a partner who's willing to shape the vision in a way that meets the city's goals, but also, um, but also delivers on um, a program that works and is sound from a fundamental standpoint at the, on the market level. And so I think that, again, thinking about how we discounted financially, but also some of the thinking we did on the intangible side of how you weigh those risks. Because I think there are different trade-offs here that, that need to be accounted for. For sure, Would it, but if the, if the lab space were the sort of third phase of the project, I mean, that's part of the repayment is also the, the right. revenue from that. So that's, so again, the loan would be contingent on that succeeding. Sure. The other thing is like, I mean, again, the vision here is much bigger than Ackridge. Ackridge's loan is like 10% of the size, right? Mm -hmm. So like, we're just got a level of risk and a size that's much more, that's much more of a, you know, something we've got to wrestle with. Sure, and you know, I'm, I'm happy to defer to someone from Peoples if they want to talk about some of their intended repayment. Um, but I think it's something that council has to consider. The scale of the loan is something that, you know, this is capital that the city will have to assemble and distribute. And that presents a certain risk that the city has to take on and would expect the, and there are different terms that can be put in place to ensure repayment or at least protect the city and insulate them from risk. Uh, but in terms of how the development comes together and you know, sort of why they propose the program they propose, I'll, I'll let Donahue speak to that. Sure, and uh, thanks so much. Uh, my name is Donahue Peebles III. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Peebles Corporation. And first of all, uh, very much appreciate the time and the opportunity to speak. Uh, Council Member Rist, uh, your point is well taken. And uh, certainly there's risk associated with the commercial piece. Uh, there's been an oversaturation of commercial office space in the market as a whole. Uh, we think that the Research Triangle and Raleigh-Durham in particular uh, is well suited and uh, will continue uh, to have increased demand for lab office. In fact, uh, my colleague Chris Minicello can come up in a moment uh, and speak with specificity uh, with respect to the tenants that we've spoken with, uh, all of whom are looking to increase their space uh, uh, in the research triangle area. Uh, more to your point uh, with respect to the um, loan. Uh, a portion of the loan certainly uh, would be repaid by the commercial component. Uh, and a portion of the loan would be drawn uh, to some degree by the commercial component. To the extent that we don't believe that the commercial component is viable, uh, we're not able to achieve pre-leasing the Council believes that there's been an oversaturation of commercial space in the marketplace and would prefer a residential execution, uh, then simply that portion of the liability is, is not drawn and the size of the loan is reduced and commensurately the risk is reduced. Uh, so the way that, that I'd encourage uh, the body to consider our proposal is that we did our best to manage competing objectives. We heard in the RFP that we needed 93 units of affordable housing in order to be highly advantageous. 
So we achieved that. We heard in the RFP there needed to be a quarter million square feet of commercial space in order to be highly advantageous. And we responded immediately to those incentives. Uh, to the extent that those aren't the incentives that are carried by the body today, or to the extent uh, that the body doesn't believe that the risk associated with the repayment of the liability corresponds with those incentives, then you will not find, and I can assure you, a more malleable partner to navigate those challenges. These transactions are complicated. We understand that political objectives change over time. We're not wedded to any particular execution. The only thing that we are wedded to is a partnership with the city of Durham. Appreciate that. No problem. Um, I've got one other question, and I don't know if we're, yeah, well, let me have one other question. So, you know, one of the big things, objectives that was not included in the RFP, but I think is really critical for Durham. I mean, look outside. This is like, this is, you know, here we got, these are climate events we're having, right? So we've got climate goals with the city. It seems to me that your proposal has nothing to say about our climate goals. Um, and I think there's an opportunity here both to build in green elements in this kind of development, right? But also access the large federal dollars that are funding things like solar mm -hmm. uh, and others. So I wonder if you've considered any kind of like much deeper kind of green component, things like, a, you know, what are they, like geothermal or something that could be paid for by, you know, green bank funds or direct pay credits. So there's a lot of opportunity as well as um, funding that can make that happen. So would would love your thoughts on that. Absolutely. And Mayor Williams, uh, I'm going to apologize. I know you mentioned earlier you wanted this meeting to last an hour, but that's a big question and it deserves a big answer. Uh, what I'll do is uh, I'll speak a little bit about our experience delivering green buildings, uh, and then I'll pass it over to my partner, to my uh, colleague, Chris Minicello, and our partners at HKS. Um, wholeheartedly agree. Uh, in fact, in order to be competitive, uh, we'll need to deliver a number of green outcomes. Uh, we have extensive familiarity with 45L credits, which are a, cons which are a consequence of ARPA, uh, most recently passed through the federal government. We have experience with solar renewable energy credits. Uh, we've built solar panels on a number of our affordable housing buildings and have leveraged a number of separate rebates in order to amortize down the cost of more environmentally friendly building systems, uh, particularly separate HVAC systems that we've used in a recently delivered affordable housing project, 17 Mississippi. Avenue Southeast in Washington, D.C. Um, with respect to this project in particular, uh, environmental sustainability is, is not only a goal, uh, it's an expectation and a point of pride for our organization. And I'll pass it over to our folks at HKS and Chris, uh, who can talk with a great degree of granularity as to what we hope to propose and accomplish here. So uh, we can't, we won't be able to hear you. And we have a potentially thousands of folks watching online. So I was able to speak to the mic. Hi, folks. It's a real privilege to be here to be able to talk about this project, but also uh, engage with you in a conversation about sustainability. We are Surface 678. We're a landscape architecture firm, basically right down the street, 215 Moore Street. We've been here for over uh, just about 30 years. We have projects here that you can go and touch and, and walk and experience. And one of the things that really struck me was the opportunity for the green roof system that they presented. And we worked with Clearscapes and Raleigh Union Station is our project, which has two green roof systems. And so what's important about this site that really is um, attractive and encouraging, you're on top of the hill, right? So when you think about your neighbors downstream and where you, know, you talked about what's happening out there today, that water is going somewhere right? It's going downstream. And so with this project, by implementing green roof systems, implementing permeable pavers, we're able to hold that water, release it slowly over time so it doesn't allow for perturbations or exaggerated stream impacts or stormwater impacts. The other thing that that green roof system does, it provides you an opportunity to think about these hot summer days. It is a way to cool an urban context with a sizable scale that allows you to engage not only that particular block, but its adjacencies. And then the third thing is the opportunity to use permeable pavers and the and not only capturing and storing that water, but thinking about the reflective quality of those pavers so they don't like hold the heat. We also have an opportunity to really think about the trees and the greenscape in this area, providing a cooling opportunity. So from a landscape architect's perspective, this is the perfect project to showcase 
where Durham stands in terms of sustainability from a site perspective. And there's many other ways that we can talk about that. Um, Adam Faust from Salmon Corporation, who is our general contractor for the team, is gonna speak briefly on the geothermal uh, wells. Good afternoon, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, so personally, my background uh, did two very large geothermal fields in DC, uh, in very urban sites as well. So happy to support the team as we look at the additional sustainability measures, uh, go through constructability for a long-term viability of a geothermal system on the site should we go that direction. I just want to reinforce our capabilities and experience uh, with those systems before turning it over back to the team. Thank you. So I just have one more question that I'll, I'll defer to my colleagues. So just as a, in a very technical financial way, so so were the city to issue limited obligation bonds to, to provide the funding for the loan, and then maybe it's kind of a question for Kim as well. Like, how do we secure this? What is that secured with? And is there, yeah. And are there, in a, yeah, yeah. And are there, and do, do statutes, <laughs> do they limit what we can then, if we're, if we, if we raise funds that way, are the limits on how we can spend that money? Yeah. So Tim Floor, finance department. And so, yes, we've had many discussions with our bond council and financial advisors. And so you would have to structure the debt in such a way that it would be, um, consistent with uh, requirements for the debt, which is we would have to parse out those pieces of the project which have a public purpose. And it would be the public purpose that we would be able to use for the funding aspect. So um, we would then have to work with the developer, the contractors to figure out what, how much and what of the different projects. So like uh, the affordable housing component, maybe parking, the infrastructure part. So we would have to try to get to that number um, and so that would be a, a, something we would have to do as we work as we'd work through the process. I mean, can we and with with what what you see that can we get there? Is there enough? Is there enough of a yeah? I, I think well, to, in, to in the conversations in the conversations I've been having, there there are different ways of getting there. If we can't get to the loan number um, amount, we there are other avenues that we could use to um, shuffle some of our other financing. Um, components, but but we feel comfortable that we could get to what where we need to get to with this proposal. Okay, thanks. That's all my questions for now. I have, I have more, but all right. Yeah, others. Mayor President. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, uh, colleagues. Thank you, staff, for um, this. Really, it's been a long time coming. Um, I, I do want to do a, a level set of some of the conversation about some of the history around this conversation and some of the players um, as well. I um, I don't know, first of all, let me just full disclose, I don't know where I'm going um, on this, but I, I will say that this count to my colleagues, if, if we want to increase the amount of affordable housing and it's certainly within our purview, but I, I do wanna address some of the characterizations um, uh, in the conversation. Firstly, the RFP is not flawed. The RFP is reflective of the conversations we've had in this community that go back to Mayor Shule, uh, Councilmember Alston, Mayor O'Neill, uh, Councilmember Reese, Councilmember Johnson. I want to honor the work, Councilmember uh, uh, Mayor O'Neill, Councilmember Hyman. Uh, I want to honor the work that was done and the listing that was done over the years. And just by way of reminder, we are here because the Fallon proposal fell through. This, this, this property would have already been developed. And to be honest, the proposals are, that are in front of us now are better than what Fallon would have given us. Um, so, so just by default, we're in a better position. The number of affordable units that were part of the original proposal came from the community. I think it was at least 80 or something. That, that number was proposed to us. We didn't, we didn't come up with that number. The number was given to us, which we embraced. So I, I think it's important to remember that um, the, the RFP is reflective of a bunch of players and a bunch of community members and a bunch of vested folk. The business people wanted something. Preserve, we heard from you know, uh, Historic Durham. They wanted the building. Um, affordable housing, which my, my background is no secret in the city. Affordable housing was incredibly important to us. Culture, we wanted culture. So there's a lot of things that we wanted in this project. And everybody got a yes. 
depending upon the lens you look at this these proposals, if you didn't get more of what you want, then you might see it as flawed. But everybody got a yes in this proposal. The question is degrees of yes. And, and is your yes big enough for you? Uh, and that's really where we are. Um, everybody's going to be happy. Nobody's probably going to be ecstatic uh, uh, when, because we're trying to fit a lot of things into this property. And part of decision making leadership is you got to make the decision at some point. We are at decision point. I do also want to speak um, to my friends um, in the coalition that's represented here today. Um, I I think five or six. I'm a, I'm a member of the overwhelming majority of the, those organizations in the coalition. Um, the I want I want us to be careful about the represent, representations we make about where the coalition stand. I'm a member of the Durham Committee on the Affairs of Black People, um, um, as is Mayor Williams and, and, and Council Member Freeman. We haven't had any meetings as a committee beyond to, to authorize a representation about specific negotiation points. For example, how many units is enough or this isn't, we haven't had those, kind, and I, I know how this organization works. So saying that we support affordable housing is one thing, but to make representations that we've somehow ceded negotiation authority for a particular proposal or a particular number has not occurred. And, that, and, and I think it's important for the public to understand that. I'm a life member of the NAACP, I'm a member of the NAACP as well. Those conversations have not occurred. Now, the general embracing of, yes, we support affordable housing certainly is the point. But beyond supporting affordable housing to say that these voices are part of or have been have have ceded authority to talk specific numbers or tweaking a particular uh, proposal, discounting that part or going on that part. I, I want to be very careful about the representations we have because we have not I'm members of these organizations. We have not had those conversations. So and I want the public to understand as well that that the internal mechanisms that would yield that type of rendering or authority has not occurred, at least in the organizations I can speak for. Um, Durham Can has its own culture, which I'm part of and, and proud of and love. So, so when the coalition speaks, I just want to be very careful that the representations we make, we ain't had a big meeting where we all kind of came together and said, do this, do this, and in case that, say this. That has not occurred. And I want to be very clear about that representation. Um, finally, again, with deference to the work that's been done by past council members, I want to honor that work. I want to honor the input of a number of stakeholders uh, in this community that have 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 come out um, and made their voices heard um, to bring us to this point. Um, so I'm I'm as I'm impressed with the people's um, recommendation. Um, I know the historic preservation people are, are impressed with keeping the building. I know the business people and and. Class A space, things have changed since COVID. So lab space, so we, we've actually been blessed that maybe that first deal did fall through because as things happen. So, you know, this this conversation has evolved. We have snapshots, but I am I am I'm impressed with the people's um recommendation. But if we want this to be a housing complex, we can do that. If we want this to be straight business, we can do that. We we have the power to do that. But I, what I want to say to my colleagues, you know, very directly is that if we're going to achieve everything that we said we wanted to do on this property, then we're going to have to make a decision. And some folk are going to be not happy uh, with what we do unless we decide we want to go one way or another. That, the crucible, that is the crucible of leadership. And that is the point we're at now. Um, so I, I want to thank the staff again for doing what we asked for issuing an RFP that keeps fidelity and, and fully reflects the, the breadth of the conversation that we've had in this community. Um, many of the stakeholders are represented in this room, but there were a whole bunch of other stakeholders who aren't here, who had voice uh, in this conversation that we tried to capture those voices and craft something that, that gives a yes, at least a partial yes to everybody. And I think the staff has done an ama uh, amazing job in doing that. And I look forward to, to further deliberations with my colleagues um, and making a final decision on this most important piece of real estate for our city. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you.
All right. Thank you so much for our comments so far. I just want to let everyone know that my computer decided to lock me out. So um, it is downstairs where all my notes are. So we're going to go blind and I'm going to follow up on my colleague who also didn't know where he was going and say, I also don't know where I'm going. I didn't uh, plan that, by the way. I promise I, I did not. <laughs> you know, I really feel like this meeting has been... Um, I just want to note that I have not been the one that's elongated this meeting. So um, anyway, that's here we are. Um, yes, I, just, I also wanted to echo, I, I know coming into this that a lot of work has gone into this project. Um, so I want to just shout out to all the council members that came before that have, have um, worked really hard and put a lot of time in, all the community members that have put a lot of time in, and also all three of the developers who put forward projects because um, y'all did a lot of work I really can see um, how each group sort of tried to meet different parts of that RFP that was put out. Um, and I think it's really impressive that uh, we have folks willing to put those forward. And also I think it's really speaks highly to Durham that folks are excited to come here and work with us and willing to, to sort of hang in on this quite a long process and, and put forth really exceptional ideas. Um, I um, also am a member of several of these organizations, um, and I, I do know that they did not get together. I also know that these organizations do have um, departments that sort of focus on housing and other spaces. And so um, I know that they don't necessarily speak in a democratic process for everyone in the city, uh, but I do think, as, as was noted by a couple of the speakers, that this is a really diverse group of people that's getting together. Um, and so I do want to pay special attention to what they have cited, because I also think that since this original RFP went out, and especially since the one before it went out, um, a lot has changed, right? And, and the mayor pro tem spoke to this, but uh, we have experienced a global pandemic. Um, affordability has drastically changed in the city, right? Just in, in the last four years, um, and, and y'all know my background too, which is working with housing insecure people. And, um, and so I have seen it firsthand uh, and what that has looked like and the needs of the community have also changed. And so um, for me, the affordability piece does feel like the most important. Um, and I, similar to, to, I think what a lot of my colleagues are, have been stated, I'm impressed with the, with the people's presentation as it's been forward so far. Um, I just wanna talk about a couple things that I feel um, just, I'm just going to note some things as they come to me because I don't have my notes in front of me. So the first thing I want to talk about is the building. And I know that um, folks in the community have a lot of strong feelings back and forth on this building. Um, I know that we've heard from Preservation Durham on um, the importance of preserving that building. Um, and I do think it's really important that when we have structures that we try and reuse them in terms of a sustainability uh, point and also potentially an economic Point. Um, however, what I'm going to say is that even before sitting on this council and hearing this from community members, which I have heard this from community members since that time, but even before then, there has been trepidation about what this space would be used for in the community. And so, again, y'all know my background. I'm not members of. I'm not a member of this specific community, um, but a lot of folks who are people of color who I interact with daily um, have really specific and very negative ties to that building as it sits there. Um, and so, like I said, it was like before I even was remotely involved in what was going to happen to this, um, I would hear um, elder Black folks in the community talk about this building and how they were concerned about what its use would be and its legacy would be because they have painful memories of it. And so I just want to like give voice to that. Again, this is not my community. I don't feel like I can speak to that in terms of a personal attachment either way, um, but those voices are really important to me. And so I just like, want to give space for that, um, that there is potentially a lot of pain there as well. Um, for me, I don't feel strongly about the preservation of the building. Again, I think if it if it added a lot in terms of a financial or an, or an environmental sustainability gain, um, that, I'm, that might shift my opinion. But at this moment, I don't feel really strongly about that. Um, and so I just wanted to, to give that voice. Um, and otherwise, uh, I really just wanna say thank you, for, especially that people's came. I, I can tell that y'all are committed to the city. Um, I think that this is a cool first draft. And like y'all have said, like 
you want to make it better, right? And I think that that's what this council wants too. We are all looking at a first draft of a project and we have space now to, to, to add to it, to think about community needs and like ever changing um, needs of our, of the city um, and what that might look like in this project. It's a really, really, really special opportunity. It's the last really large parcel downtown. Um, and so I'm excited to see where we can get with this. I don't think it's, where I want to see it yet. Um, affordability, I think for me is going to be number one, seeing more affordable units, um, potentially even at the cost of some of the commercial. I do want to see that the commercial is maintained though. I do think that that's super important. Um, we need commercial spaces in downtown Durham. I'd especially like to see it potentially be open for local small businesses, um, some affordable commercial and smaller uh, storefronts as well, I think it would be a really nice mix. So that's something that I'd like to see. Um, but as my colleagues have stated and, and several members of the community, I think the city retaining the rights and the land is gonna be uh, for me probably the biggest thing. So those are my thoughts right now. And if I get my notes back, I'm also gonna um, deliver some thoughts from council member Baker who uh, was unfortunately not able to make this meeting, but I wanna do him justice and and read my notes. <laughs> so All right. come back to me if it, if it changes. Go ahead, council member. Thank you. Um, I agree with most everything that's been said. You know, I think um, Council Members Freeman, myself, and Mayor Pro Tem, I think this is our, our third rodeo. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, as always, thank you to the staff um, because we, we know it's a, it's been a lot for y'all. Uh, in general, I'm very pleased with, with the direction that staff is taking us. I think that out of the proposals received, people's, quite frankly, is the most interesting. Um, and so I, I, I'm not sure, I don't 100% agree with the motions that are in front of us, um, but I do agree with the general direction of uh, yes to to the the people's, people's concept um, most generally. Um, I will just name, I quite frankly love the uh, saving of the building as many know, uh, and the, the conversion to a hotel because it does hit uh, the commercial piece uh, really, really importantly. Um, those of us who are sitting in spaces with Discover Durham and DDI, we, we know that we are critically under-resourced in downtown hotels, and it does actually prevent us from doing some of the bigger festivals and some of the other things that you're seeing, Raleigh and things. And we do actually have to think about that as a community. As much as we want to not think about that, we have to compete, right? And and maybe that, that doesn't sound good or feel good and, and to think about that, but people have lots of choices when they move to the triangle. They, that That's one of its assets is that you can find your flavor within 30 minutes of different communities. And so we want folks to visit us. Uh, and so a hotel in that space kind of, um, you know, really helps us keep the building, which we've that that has been a content or that has been a group that has been very loud and clear from day one. Uh, and I will say that I was not one of the folks who was in favor of uh, preserving that building uh, from the get. And then I heard very loud and clear <laughs> um, wh why it was important. Um, and also, also, I think it, the, the building wasn't a police station originally. It was an insurance building uh, by a, a modernist architect who, whose most of his stuff has actually been destroyed. Uh, it's one of the last intact uh, buildings that he still has in the area. And um, I feel like family at some point even reached out to council to talk about the legacy of the architect itself um, or, or himself. Um, so that part I really love. I hear folks around the affordability and if we can get more units, great. I was not one of the council members who wanted 250,000 square feet of, reach of, uh, of commercial. I think y'all remember that. Um, so if there has to be more affordable, if, if, if there's a way to trade out um, uh, the the commercial for affordable units, I'm open to that. And then I will say that the retention of land, um, I don't know how we, this kind of push and pull that the people's team has, has indicated, you know, things change on the ground. We are in an extremely volatile moment. Let's just hope maybe after November, um, some interest rates go down. Um, I think that there's going to be a lot of things that are happening uh, economically um, in the next four to five months that are going to change some things. Um, so I, th I think the retaining of the land, and, and I'll say this, and I'll say that this isn't, you know, 2018, 2019, uh, you know, was just such a different economic moment uh, than, it, than it's than it been. And retaining five and a half acres of downtown land in city ownership is just really, um, it just gives us leveraging and power in a way that 
I don't know. Well, we don't get it back. We're not going to be able to afford to ever get it back. So those are those are the only things that I I have some kind of like how do we how do we negotiate with those things in mind. Other than that, I am actually really delighted uh, with the proposal by Peebles. I think it really um, speaks to the kind of team we're going to get here. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate my colleagues' comments. I will say I was holding off trying to figure out the, there was a woman, she's a black woman. She was speaking on behalf of retaining the Milton small building. She was one of the architects. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I, I just want to say that that piece of this can get lost and just how much when we talk about history of this, this city um, is, is so diverse and tied in ways in which we're so progressive 50, 60 years ago, and we can kind of just mull over it and dismiss it um, today with the issues of, uh, of affordable housing. And so I just want to be careful with that. I also will just say that um, there were a number of environmental issues that she mentioned that would be unearthed and removing that structure that I don't want to see happen. And so I will say that I'm very adamant that the building be maintained and in place and that we figure out whether it's a hotel or not. I'm not, I'm, I'm partial to that at all. I don't mind either way, but I do know that um, hearing the dialogue in this iteration, there's so many red flags that were raised. Uh, first, I wanna thank um, Mayor Pro Tem Middleton in, in identifying the first, which uh, we wanna be careful when we're speaking on behalf of black people who aren't in the room. Um, I'm very clear that I've had lots of conversations with folks in the community, but I don't try to speak on behalf of them. Um, I try to speak on behalf of myself and what I understand from what they've said. I um, I know that I've sat in the room. I'd also wanna say that it's not just limited to the Durham Committee and, North, and the NAACP, but I wanna say the People's Alliance also has a very democratic process. And I wanna make sure that we're honoring that as well. I am, excited by all the various opportunities of what, I mean, when you talk about geothermal and um, environmentally sustainable roofs, all those things are very exciting, but I'm really like cautioned because this is the third iteration that I want to make sure that we don't, we don't stop. What was it? The enemy of good is not perfect. Something to that effect that people say all the time. I don't want to keep doing this. I don't want to keep reliving this. And it is, it is, there's been so many hours poured into this. There's so much money poured into this. And I know on the developer side, this is one case where I'm like, or one situation where I'm like, I feel so bad for the developers who have been involved in this. I am just, I am just that grateful. That is where, I'm letting you know. I am just grateful that they're still willing to, to consistently um, show up and, and make sure that we understand that they're willing to be good partners and do what, what the city needs um, to be done on this site. I will say that the land retaining or the land retaining option really is appealing. I will say that I am not willing to not build in order to have it because this project has, I mean, this is, I've been on this council seven years. This is, we're going into year eight. I mean, goodness gracious. Like it would be so nice if this would have been done four years ago and it would be nice five years ago. And if we don't get it done, that affordability is still unattainable for the same people we're, we're talking about we want to have affordable housing. And I will add to that, that when we talk about affordability, it is not just limited to units. It is also transportation, the location of this site, and then also the jobs. And so having that commercial space may not be appealing to some, but I do want to make sure I resurface that conversation that those folks who live in the building, if they can work downstairs, it's so much cheaper and it's so much greener. Um, that doesn't mean that everyone will, but the option to have not just office, but life science in the area, especially downtown, um, acknowledging how undiverse our business community or business office space is right now. I know the conversation with North with Northgate and a couple of other locations, they're all, we have to hear that that's the pulse of where we're going. and whether it's 250 or or 200 or 275 is not really my you know sticking point it's really just making sure that this project gets done because it, i'm i mean willard street is done that's the benefit of having it done so um you know this is post 300 500 west main street 
um, I'm sorry, East Main Street and acknowledging how the city, how the county was able to get that housing moving there. The opportunity for those folks to be in those units is much sooner because it's done. And so I do wanna make sure that, that that's the sticking point for me is that I wanna get it done. I wanna make sure that there is additional housing. If it could be more units, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with where we are. So I'll leave it at that. I think I've covered just about all of my things. I really appreciate the, the comments of my colleagues um, beforehand because that does always always help in in just navigating where you sit where you sit because I think we're 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 essentially saying the same things in different ways with different priorities but we do know that the housing has to be a main focus and if we can keep the land that is a good it's good it's all right yeah um council member Freeman it was um it was Phil Freelon's team that redid the redaptive use of the police station, and she was, I think, one of the first uh, Black women principal architects, if not in North Carolina, maybe the Southeast. So I just want to name that history. Shirley. So also Patricia Harris was the first um, African-American licensed architect in the state yeah. of North Carolina, female African-American. That, that was the one that came to speak with us, actually. The preservation people, yeah. Uh, and I wanted to make sure that that that's clear, like the preservation of those of that land or preservation of that building means preserving a little bit, a little piece of history that ties them to that insurance company that became a police department that can be become something different um, that will be beneficial to the city of Durham. Thank you. No, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can you turn that mic on? Colleagues, colleagues, thank you so much for for really robust conversation. I I, I do want to, um, with respect to the the sale of the building just kind of drop a, a bit of a historical a tidbit. So one of the things we, one of the options was we just sell the land for a gazillion dollars, take the money and do affordable housing wherever else. The leverage, at the second choice, if you, were, if, you, if you will, was, well, do what, you know, they used to do to folk via restrictive covenants. We sell it with terms because one of the things we wanted to do was also uh, get a significant financial windfall. That was one of our goals as well. And the way to do that was we could either, and, and I remember Jillian Johnson spoke spoke very um, eloquently uh, about the pitfalls of self-developing, retaining the land and developing it ourselves, the city becoming a developer. And we didn't want any parts of that. Um, so selling the land would get a significant, a significant financial windfall. However, selling it, as you can do under terms, you know, we'll only sell it to you if you agree to do such and such and such forever and, and, and in perpetuity. So I, I, you know, I, I come down on the side of wanting to retain ownership as well, but historically the conversation tracked along the lines of how do we achieve the goal of getting a financial windfall, but also still make sure our values are, are retained on that land. So it, it wasn't just selling it and letting them walk away. It was selling it under restrictions. Um, which got us money up front, but also put affordable housing there, put the things that we wanted there. And we got to participate also in f a future sale uh, as well as has been reflected. So I just wanted to put that uh, in context. Um, we weren't just taking the money and running. We were we were selling it with under specific circumstances, which which benefited us uh, financially and in terms of accomplishing of, of mission as well. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You got your computer back. Yeah, do your thing. Yeah, so I, I think that um, y'all have heard my priorities, and then I think that there's also some things that we just want to talk about, just since y'all are in the room. Um, if we do end up moving forward with people's, uh, just to sort of know that these are things that Council Member Baker, I'm going to do his list first, and then I've, I've sort of been thinking about that would be awesome to see. In addition, it might not be make or break for us, but um, would be just things that we'd like to to see at least thought about in a creative manner. Um, so I'm just gonna read his list. Um, so the first one is a voluntary restriction of rent increases on the market units uh, to maximum of 5% or something tracking a rate of inflation, but some sort of um, rental increase on those market rents that would be voluntary. Obviously we can't require that um, under North Carolina state law, but obviously developers are always welcome to voluntarily uh, track the market and inflation rates. And so that's something that he was talking about. Um, we've, I think that this conversation has been um, 
has been really prevalent, but having all that open space be publicly dedicated, um, I think that there that would potentially track if we maintained the land. Um, but if there was in fact some sale of the land, just ensuring that that uh, public space be what it is. We heard public, 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 um, and and I think that's a concern as well. Uh, he is really uh, focused on good site planning. Uh, street level activation above and beyond sidewalk width, right? Not just following the UDO, but potentially going above and beyond uh, with the width. Uh, street trees, I know actually y'all talked about that with um, having environmental, um, having a mind towards environmental sustainability and in terms of a cooling potential of having trees. Uh, specifically, he was looking for trees along the street um, as, a, as a safety buffer and also for the coolant purposes that y'all talked about. Um, diverse retail space would go into this high quality uh, first floor design, window transparency, um, and good bike infrastructure, potentially even with a bike path running through, or if it's around, at least it's protected, potentially raise that sort of thing. Um, he talked about a c affordable commercial space. You heard me talk about that a little bit earlier too. Uh, we're just keeping mindful that um, a lot of our local North uh, local Durham businesses are, are getting pushed out of downtown uh, due to high rent. So it would be really cool to see um, a diversity in terms of commercial space. And if we could get space for local businesses, entrepreneurs, I think that would be great. Um, and he talked about that it can be revenue, revenue neutral. He's not really fussed that it be necessarily revenue maximizing, but of course, I think we all want it to be self-sustaining and um, we don't want it to be a deficit in the, in the community. Uh, for me, another piece that I was looking at is that y'all had um, units for sale in addition for rent. And I would love to see some affordability tied in for those for sale units as well. So that's something that um, I wanted to add. Um, and then since I'm just going, I'm just going to say one more thing, which is not really relevant to that list. Um, but I would I would love in a, in terms of giving direction, um, I would love to have the city attorney's office um, do an analysis of of some of the financial um, underlying things that are going on here, uh, that would be helpful for me to have that background and making that decision. This is something really far out of my um, knowledge. And we heard a great presentation from the consultant, but we also have great minds in, um, in, in house. And so that would be, I think, really helpful just to, to make sure that we all understood the legalities. Um, and so if, if that is something that the city's attorney would, office would be willing to do to work with maybe the consultant or the developers, um, and just to give us an analysis of that, that would be awesome. So those are my requests. <clears throat> thank you. Well, colleagues, thank you all for your comments. I know that you guys are going to keep us in good legal shape. I know you're going to make sure we're, we're good. Um, General Services, you guys are taking the lead on this with the legal person at the tip. And um, so good point, Councilmember Cook. I think uh, for me, much of the comment, much, well, actually, I think Councilmember Freeman said it best. We're, we're pretty much saying the similar similar things, just in different ways. Um, I think for me, I this is a case that I, and I'll now admit it, I was hoping to prolong it. I know it's, we've been wanting to get it done, but I just felt the market was just not ready. It wasn't in a good space for us, you know? And I think that, you know, with interest rates being, uh, hopefully will change, uh, we can get more bang for our buck, which will give you all more flexibility to do more. So I know folks wanted us to hurry up and finish this project or hurry up and get it started. I didn't. And and I'll be honest, I was actively trying to prolong it because I, I, and I, and I still think that we uh, can, I, I do want to hurry up and get it done, but I think that this is a matter where we, uh, where t we take our time and hurry up. Um, yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. Just when we, <laughs> let's take our time. Let's hold our horses here. Let the interest rates drop. Let's, you know, reapply the financial model and see where we are. And, and, and then, you know, we sign the dotted line and, uh, and see where we end up because, you know, the, the housing units and, you know, just everything around it, um, will make a, make a difference, I believe. Uh, I think this is a case where we we I do appreciate the partnership in this. 
you know, uh, to you, all of the partners there with Peoples, I, I appreciate it because I think this is an experimental process that we can take here in Durham where we can truly put our best foot forward. Um, I'm not going to look at this case as a traditional development case where, you know, we're tugging and pulling after the planning commission, you know, has seen the case and all of this and all of that. And it's like, all right, so what, we're not looking at the pro forma. We're just trying to get what we can out of it and we can't force anything, but this is an opportunity where it appears that your upfront investment of time in this project has shown that, that you actually give a ding about this, uh, this, this, this site. You've worked hard for it. You're here. And I can appreciate that. And I, I, um, so I feel like there, there's some honesty here, uh, and, and that we can really work together. Um, I was one of the initial ones, uh, not initially, but when I got on council, who put some conditions around preserving the building, only because I was worried about the cost that it would take to restore it. Um, but if we can make it economically work, then I'm definitely for it. When I'm thinking about um, the fact that we are woefully underwhelming when it comes to hotel beds in downtown, uh, turning this into a revenue generator, um, whereas, you know, folks are trying, they're traveling to Mooresville and Cary and Burlington to stay in hotels for events in Durham and Raleigh. You know, uh, I think that this is prime now that we have a hotel proposed and our occupancy tax is now reallocated to generate, uh, pro uh, to, to be generating revenue to go toward building assets and amenities. Uh, specifically, I think we're, we're collectively moving in the right direction. Um, a question I have was just around the specifics of commercial. We we are experiencing uh, some 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 losses downtown, and it hurts me to my core because these are my friends, my peers, who are closing their restaurants. You know, um, these are the folks that I I text with late at night, like, okay, how was your sales today? You know, yeah, we're down too. You know, I'm I'm feeling that burn that they have. Uh, in July, my own personal restaurant was was sales were now eighty percent. So I'm like worried. What are we going to do? You know, um, it is different issues. You know, parking is not the issue for us. It's just foot traffic. You know, so how do we get people out and about? <clears throat> and as a practitioner in this, I I wouldn't dare say give me uh, just affordable commercial space. What I would say is I, I'm I'm mostly okay with the amount of the square footage for commercial if we can have some specificity around it because we need an anchor. Everybody goes to the grocery store. And when you go to the grocery store, you can also see what's next to it. You know, so we have the amount of space that can handle commercial that's going to actually generate foot traffic. Then our businesses will sustain. My, I and, and I think Council Member Freeman, you may have been the one that said this, but you know, uh, I talk about affordable living over affordable housing all the time, and it does matter. And I'll give my personal story as an example. I live right there under the flashing bull, right at, right at Old Bull. And uh, my job outside of City Hall is my restaurant, which is right on campus. And I get to walk to it. And I can park my vehicle, and I don't have to use it. Or I get on a scooter, which is why people laugh at me all the time, because I'm always on a scooter, because I get to walk everywhere I go. So it allows me to have a bit more financial flexibility. Now, imagine if we can create that experience for more people, and therefore we have more, you know, finances that could be, uh, that can have some versatility, you know, in the household. And I think about that. And to me, that's affordable living. Um, but just giving someone a single component that doesn't mesh well with everything else that they have to do it doesn't really help the situation. You may feel good doing it, but it doesn't really help the overall situation. So I think about the holistic approach. So uh, Council Member Freeman, I appreciate you highlighting that. Um, so if it will be 250,000 square feet, then I'd like some, you know, I'd like to know what type of specificity is gonna be there because we need, a, we need an anchor. Uh, businesses that are up and, and operating right now, they don't have a problem operating. They can make the money, but if it's nobody to sell the product to, then they're not going to sustain. They're not going to survive. And uh, we've heard a lot of issues, why, a lot of reasons why people are leaving downtown. Trust me, I know for a fact they're all very different. But one thing is consistent is where are the people? And if we're thinking that we're going to put a big office lab there, look at around 321 Coffee where that was. I mean, Google's in that building. 
And there was someone having coffee the other day and they saw a hundred people walk by and two people walked in for coffee, you know, cause they're going inside the building, which is really insulated and they have everything they need inside food, coffee, everything. So we just want to be really intentional about the types of tenants that we're attracting as well. Not saying we don't want Google. We definitely want them because those are really good paying jobs and we get our revenue through the taxes, right? Uh, but this is an opportunity for us to partner together to be really intentional. Uh, I don't want to over restrict you all. Um, I want you to have the flexibility to put your best foot forward. But what I'm saying is I want to be a partner with you in that and, and, and be realistic. I know that, you know, the more we increase affordable affordable units, the more the financial model is going to have to shift because I know that, you know, the more uh, affordable units you have, the harder it is to finance. And we have to say, all right, well, we're going to do this, increase this here. Then we have to look at how do we generate and make sure this is pinnable that you can actually, that's not a word. We got to make it work. Right. Uh, but at the same time, we want to stay true to our values too. And that's the number one priority on this as well. So I, uh, I don't know who said this either, but about those four cell units, having that, you know, more accessible as well or attainable, uh, I think that is that is that's a really good opportunity. So I think that we can create a model here that can be iconic for other cities and municipalities to look at and 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 um and make sure that they uh can see how we did it. Yeah, and um I think those were mainly all of oh and just looking at what's happening around it you know let, let's let's not ignore the fact that it's while privately owned there's about 12 acres of land that's next door to you that's underutilized right now there's nothing happening um and we want to make sure that we are talk to those folks to see what will go there uh eventually uh and also the Durham rail trail is coming the Durham rail trail is coming and we can activate that space collaboratively I foresee this part of downtown being reimagined. Um, and yeah, this is this is my interest in this, you know, without saying, hey, let's just put a convention center there. Um, <clears throat> this this works. I I love it. Well, I'm that should go on the freeway cap, actually. So <laughs> it's coming. Um so, where we, so this is on the we'll be on the GVA as, as well, right? So because there's a several motions. So so how do we yeah. So our uh, Madam Manager was waiting on me to finish running my mouth uh, so that she can get to that part. Um, but yeah, I, I think the last main thing for me is why well, I, I said the question that I have, but I didn't ask it. How do we get more specificity around types of commercial space? I understand what the markets are saying about lab space and all of that, but how do we activate this? Press that button to turn it on till, till it's green and then speak up into it. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I, I appreciate you asking that. It's something that we really focused on in the original proposal, specifically the base proposal, is creating a holistic community that benefits from each of the components, right? They, they, they live in harmony, right? So the ground floor retail, I believe it was a, a request of um, Councilmember Baker, right? Where he said he wants community retail that can serve or that can operate at a neutral capacity, right? We, for, we firmly believe in that because community retail that's great for the community operates at a neutral capacity, but serves to the greater benefit of the community, both on our master plan and the wider community. So for us, it's reaching out to local stakeholders and community members and businesses to help fill in those spaces to where it services the apartment uh, users, the office users, and the wider community. Could you kind of define that a bit for me, community retail? Of course, that? yeah, absolutely. So when I mean community retail, I mean, the, the retail that you'll see servicing um, apartment buildings traditionally, liner retail that is, say, convenience or, uh, say... Like dry cleaners. Yeah, dry cleaners, yeah. food and beverage, things that you want to go to and be a part of. Things will activate the community and pull people in, right? Also convenience retail, right, with dry cleaners and, and, and things of that nature. An anchor tenant is, I think, imperative. It's something that... Um, I mean, for, for a good six to eight months, uh, was nearly our full-time job to try to find who would be the appropriate uh, fit there. Um, we've had very positive conversations to that end um, and are excited to chase down leads to help find out what would be the right solution there. Certainly open to bringing those discussions to, to the city to help you know come to a resolution as to who would be the best fit, um, but we're excited 
uh, and and or, or I think largely aligned in that in that sense. I'm tossing a lead out there. We we are woefully underwhelming when it comes to hotel space. You guys answer that. We don't have a grocery store downtown. It's we, heard loud we, and clear. That's we do not have a grocery store downtown. <laughs> Put away from me, I don't understand why no one sees it as attractive enough to put one there. Yeah. But I mean, you want to activate people and make Durham downtown much happier? Yeah, because right now we all get in our cars and have to drive to 9th Street or we get on the bus and have to, you know, ride over to 9th Street mm -hmm. and come back and yeah. That's, um, that's it's heard loud and clear. Scott Baltimore on our team from HKS has built out and helped us curate those retail spaces on the ground floor. There is conveniently a very large box there for somebody that I, something yeah. that I think could serve as a community. Yeah, and and before I finish, I want to reiterate what uh, Councilmember Riss was talking about. I was at a U.S. Conference of Mayors uh, meeting, and the, the Secretary of Energy, uh, Department of Energy, was there, the administrator, and quote, uh, "We have so much money; it's hard to get rid of." So it's a good problem to have. Yes. Yeah. Incorporate yeah. as much as you can. I promise you my letter of support will be waiting for you. And I will signal my channels to submit their letters of support. And that is what I mean by being a partner. Uh, we have um, brought a lot of money into the triangle just through infrastructure. Uh, and there's a formula that we have for that. And I would, out of my office, would be right on if, if we go with you guys. Thank you. I want to add that the office of Deidreana Freeman will also be on board with that as well. Here it is. <laughs> Thank you. We're very excited. All right. Uh, so, Madam Manager. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, for an opportunity to speak very briefly. Um, we have this item uh, on your work session agenda today, and we have um, a recommendation for a development team to be the preferred development team. That development team has presented a base proposal as well as an alternate proposal. Uh, and there's another significant item here for you to authorize the city manager to negotiate a non-binding term sheet that would outline the terms of the development agreement and other required uh, documents. What we've heard a lot of um, vision, um, we, we've heard a lot of uh, ideas that we've heard from the developer who has joined us here, what I would like to do is bring the um, our consultant and or our team here um, who's, you know, who, who came to present the information uh, to, it's not really a, a response to everything that has been said, but their professional opinion about if we place this item on consent or GBA, and it sounds like GBA would be the agenda, what would we what would we be doing or what would they need to tell us when we talk about it the next time? So I hope that that is not putting them on the spot, but I think it would be helpful uh, helpful to us. Mr. Mayor, can I, as they come, do you mind if I, 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 I Madam Manager, I appreciate you uh, for, for providing that context because I, I do want to speak Brief to, to process and and um, keep integrity to process. We we issued an RFP. Um, that RFP has been responded to. We now actually have concrete proposals before us. So all things considered, I'm I'll put a stake in the ground. I I am comfortable with people's base uh, proposal. If it, it just in deference to the RFP, we 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 ask for proposals. The proposals will come back. This is the one I would be prepared um, to support. You know, now if 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 the majority of us want to reopen the RP process or or nuances or give direction to um, maybe tweak some things that you can negotiate or see if it's workable within this within this within this uh, proposal, run the numbers, see how that would impact it. Um, then I'm certainly comfortable with that. But in deference to the process, um, I think this RFP reflected the conversations we've had. Um, the system has worked. We've got proposals back. There's a recommendation for proposal, and, and I'll state that I am comfortable with people's base proposal. And I, if, if, if it came down to it, I would vote for it. Thank you. And, and to that point, I would agree, and I would also be um, okay with moving forward with the people's base. So, Mr. Mayor, 
from my perspective, I also support Peoples. I think it's the best. I think I love the vision, as I said. I think it's the best we've got here. Um, I'm not prepared to support the motion, though. I think there's another step here. I would love to have general services have another conversation with Peoples and to just because I don't because I know last time with Fallon, it took us a year to find out it didn't work, right? I'd love to have a conversation to say, what would it look like if some of the stuff we talked about here were in were part of the proposal? That it was a long-term ground lease, not a sale, right? If there were more affordable housing, for example. So I think those kind of I think there's maybe five or six questions we'd love to have the general services team explore with peoples to know whether we want to then enter that agreement. But I'm not prepared to support that yet until I'd like to see one further discussion with with uh, with peoples. Right. And let's turn these mics off, Middleton. Oh. I have just one question around that. And so just because I know when we went through it the first time, there were some concerns. What I what I don't want to happen is that um, there's, because if this were operating as an economic development conversation, it'd be very different than it is under general services. And what's public and what's not public um, is different. I don't want us to hinder the ability. So what I'm saying is if we did agree to the base and the terms, those things that Councilmember Barris mentioned could still happen and would still happen. But what I don't want to happen is that we hinder our staff from actually being able to move forward with a developer that's from the RFP that we've made the request on. And so I don't want us to, to be the preventer and, and us being able to move forward. Um, I want to make sure that we're being supportive of the staff and getting through this third process and moving us to the next step to make sure that the details that, that have been outlined, I think those are, like as the city manager mentioned, those, of the vision, all that's been taken into account, I don't think that the staff would not take all of that and try to push it all forward. And so I do want to just offer a, a kind of, I know that council member at risk and Cook are newer and Baker, I do think that our staff, I do have high, um, comfort with the staff pushing forward on some of those things that have been stated. And I don't think that that should stop us from moving forward. So I, I just want to say that. Mr. Mayor, if I might just uh, dovetail on council member Freeman and amplify what she said and associate myself with the comments. I, I, um, I agree because be, we're at, when at, at the point now we're making a decision and, and I mean this, you know, from a policy making point of view, I'm not sure what, when is what 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 number is of more would be sufficient? I mean, if we started at ninety, would we have said one hundred? If they had brought a hundred, would we say one twenty? From a from a decision making point of view, what what does more mean? Is it five more? Is it what number is sufficient? And if we know what that number is, maybe we should just say that now, because two is more, one is more. So from a policy making point of view actual decision-making and substituting variables. Um, I think we're at a point now where we, we you know, we, we're, we've got to be very precise and specific with our language. Um, how much is enough? Um, do we just want to make this an entire affordable housing project? And, and you know, we should say that. And, and I say that because we all share the same values, but when it comes to the actual decision-making, the actual nuts and bolts of, of making the policy, we need actual numbers now. We're at the point now where we've got to substitute the variables and 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 fill in the blanks. So if we've got a number, we should say it. Thank you. This um, well, let me go here first, and then I'll go over. Yeah, I, I think when I spoke, I just said I, that I wasn't sure. There are some motions within here that I think we we do need to take up, regardless, like the HNRA part of the contract that needs to move forward. It's why I said I'm not sure which motions need to stay and which don't. Um, I think the thing. Uh, to, to Council Member Freeman and Mayor Pertem's point, yes, they've responded to the RFP. Yes, I'm open to negotiation as long as I'm not then stuck with the thing that I don't want. And what I don't want is not to have a thorough conversation on the land piece of it, because I that is that that is the thing that gives me the most anxiety. Because to Mayor Pertem's point, in 2018 we thought we were going to get a windfall of cash, and that's not what's happening here. And so if I can't get a windfall of cash, then what's the best alternative for me financially long-term for the city and for residents? And that's maintain that's ownership. It's always gonna be ownership in a, in, a, in a country that we got down this at our work session the other day, in a country that 
really does real estate speculation, right? And we, we had that. So just like for individuals, we really think about wealth generation. We have to think about wealth generation for the city of Durham. Um, and so that that's the piece that I just, that's why I asked for that clarity. I'm fine with this thing as long as then I'm not screwing myself the six months down the road. That, that's what I want to know. Say it so crassly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I want to piggyback off of that. And I, and I, and, you know, council member risk can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think what I'm hearing is that there's, there's just trepidation in terms of, of going in too far down the line and then realizing that things might look different than what we think that they are going to look like. And so if we can know that sooner rather than later, we can really have an honest conversation about what things we're willing to cut and what things we're not. Right. And so, um, I don't think anybody I actually think every single person that has spoken has talked about the importance of commercial. I don't think anybody here wants to cut all the commercial or retail. I don't think that's been said by anyone. Um, and um, and I and I do think that we're talking about where what might it look like? What could it look like with a substantial um, greater affordable units? And so I, and I am happy to put it forth a number because um, the six organizations that came forward in this uh, community group asked specifically for 175 affordable units. That was the specific asked, and they were looking at a 60% AMI, I believe. Um, I, and it's not that it's make or break in, in terms of numbers for me, but that is a substantial number amount more than what was offered originally. And so what I would like to see is um, is some conversation, and, and I do trust the staff to, to have that conversation. It's just that I want them to have the conversation sooner rather than later, and then we can sort of decide in terms of what we want to commit to uh, with more information up front as opposed to having it later down the line. Um, if y'all have worked with me now for six months, you know that I like to have all of the things in front of me when I make the decisions, and so that's why I pull everything off the agenda, and that's kind of what I am thinking here too. Um, and again, it's those numbers, to me, like, I think, you know, Councilmember Freeman put it really well. They're not affordable until they're built, right? Like, no number is affordable. We have zero affordable units right now. So that is something to keep in mind. And I think we're all sort of ready to, to start um, in on the on that process. Um, but I, I would agree with that. I want to see what it can look like, um, given what we've talked about here today. I saw these folks taking copious notes. So I know that they're listening and I feel like we're going to get some conversation and that could come back sooner rather than later. And then we could really make a decision moving forward. So. Well, I turn to your own, Michael. Um, I was just going to ask if on the base of people's folks feel comfortable, because I feel like if you, the more you can knock out the motion that might be, you know, a unanimous, it's a little bit easier for staff to move us along, but um, just in, in acknowledging, like, if we at least have that part, then that's done. And then we can move forward with those six areas of negotiation that folks have mentioned, like, that could be something just on the units and the land. So um, just hold on one second, uh, Councilman Riss, um, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I um. I'm cool with 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 you know whatever whatever this council wants to do, which what's in our purview to do. But I I do want to draw a distinction between tweaking what's before us or reopening the RFP process, which is is and which which is which is we can do that if we want to do that. But but if if, if I might, there are no surprises in these proposals. We knew that selling the land with terms was was one of the things was within the purview of what we asked for. I mean, we we could have said, we're keeping the land, send us proposals based upon keeping it. We didn't do that. So if we wanted, if we want to do that, if we want to explore some other options, we can do that. But I I just want to call a thing a thing. If 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 we're doing, if we want to reopen the RFP process, because we can tweak this thing to a point where it is substantively different from what we've asked for, where the numbers are totally different. And that's that's just math. That's just the way it works. And which I'm not, I don't have a problem with, but I just want to be, you know, just blatantly call it what it is. It, we have a new council, we have new council members. 
I think someone said earlier, you know, priorities change and things change. This, it's, it's a deliberative process, which I honor and love. But, you know, I just want to call it what it is. If, if, if we're not satisfied with these proposals, tweaking them to a certain point is a de facto reopening of the RFP process. And, and, and I think I want to just, just call it what it is. Um, and I see, you know, some staff nodding. So, I mean, I, I want to just, you know, call it what it is. Okay, right. real quick, uh, before I go here, um, your request was allow the staff to go back and uh, provide, what what, what what was your request earlier? Yeah, be a little clear. Uh, what, what I was trying to bring us to is we, ha we are in an agenda cycle. When we're here in the work session, it's going to be 11 days until we get to the council meeting on that Monday night. We have motions in front of us. I heard commentary that some council members are not really comfortable with the motions, which would mean there would have to be changes in the motions between here and the council meeting. And so what I wanted us to be able to do is determine whether or not on in 11 days from now, we have enough information from the majority or a consensus from the council um, that the words that we see here in front of us are going to represent what can be approved uh, 11 days from now, because we will need to do that. Because when we leave this meeting, we go back and, you know, we don't get the direction that we need. You may not be happy 11 days from now. Okay. So for the, for my sake of leading us to directing the staff, what needs to be said, can I, just do a quick poll. Out of the options we have, and, and Madam Attorney, you just give me a nod if I'm out of line here. Out of the options we have, are we saying we are okay with going with Peebles? Just based on what I'm hearing. People's base. People's base. Okay. Now, we understand where we're going with that. We are now looking to modify requests does that require us to go back and reopen the RFP, which I don't think we need to. What we're looking at is how can how much can we, I guess, how much time does it take to uh, consider where we are about equally split on, which is what are the options, not necessarily split, curiosity, where, what does it look like to sell the land with terms or or lease the land, like, like a 99-year lease or something. And the other is, you know, how much more affordable units can we do and how, how does that shift the financial model? Um, so I think um, what, I'm, what I'm hearing is that there's a preferred development firm. Yes. And that there's two focus areas which you would like the staff to focus on as we move into development of a term sheet. Affordable, affordable percentage. Yeah, looking and hard land. at what the affordable number of affordable units looks like. Yes. And um, additionally, looking at the opportunity to have the land be permanently owned by the city in some sort of longer term framework. Now, those, so, those are those are the, those are the things we're looking at. Yes. But I think we we have two different things we have to do here. We have to provide you all with direction. Mm -hmm. And I think within that direction, we need to provide some, considering the wordage, the, the verbiage right. here, we have to provide you some flexibility so that we're not locked in under a motion. Right. But we are giving you direction to move forward so that we can provide, you can provide us with options to choose from after it's been reconsidered. Right. I think we could work on the motion that says... Um the non-binding term sheet and add some words like with some intentionality around X number of units that y'all could tell us and additionally looking to a land long-term land lease as a potentiality. So giving us some opportunity in that framework to have further discussions with the developer, but also giving them some fidelity that they are spending money to do this work, that there are real costs for this, that they right. have yeah. worked hard to provide something that achieved the goals as we defined them previously. But so that gives them some fidelity as we move forward with a motion of, yeah, this is the preferred team and we're going to go negotiate with some focus on the areas that we feel like need to be bolstering, na namely 
X number of units. And if y'all want to tell us that number of units. Well, uh, can, or, can we hold on? Because that, yeah. that's I'm, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a bit yeah. afraid of that language yeah. because we don't have performance in front of us. We're not financiers. Yeah, so maybe having but, an option of ranges, but us telling... Yeah. But there may be a way to say there is a preference for some smaller units versus larger units. Or there, there may be some way for us to have some conversation and present back to y'all in 11 days some high-level kind of frameworks for... The yeah. same way we do with budget, some optionality stuff. Just let's look at let's look at affordability uh, of units through type and volume, and mm. let those options come out. I, again, I sell chicken for a living, so I, I don't build housing. Right. So I don't. I feel uncomfortable telling you how much it should be when I'm not paying for it. But that's why I mean we can be a partner in this. So I want to give you all staff and the developer mm -hmm. flexibility to come up with ranges to provide us in options. Well, I can just say you're right. Ranges because I think it's going to cost different different right. things. Could change the numbers. So like some kind of range of like yes, we're open to more affordable. This is what it might look like. And we're, but you know, and we're open to a ground lease. Uh, I think I think if we those are what we want to hear. I think. And and, and then if if that's if if that's agreeable to the developer, then I think the motion then becomes much simpler to support. And if I could just make sure to to kind of pull in. Um, Councilmember Baker, in his absence, the conversation around the market rate being, um, but if, if, if there's an opportunity to do that, I want to offer that I would be willing to go up to 80 and not 100. Like there should be some some additional flexibility on what affordable is if we can actually maintain market rate rents at a 5% for um, inflation, because that that type of that type of rent rate is more beneficial for a larger per percentage of the folks in our population, even though we want to make sure that there's a targeted number that is specific to 60 and below. I want to make sure that, that if there is an additional 100 or 100 units or a number of units, that there is a lot more flexibility on the conversation of what that affordability looks like. And right. ho hopefully, yeah. I, I apologize, Mr. Mayor. I just want to say, I, I want you as a developer to be very careful because I want to provide fidelity to the space to negotiate. I don't want you to make any promises or concessions or anything today. I just wanted you to hear this conversation. So whatever you're about to say, just- No, no worries. That is and uh, certainly uh, I know better than to come up to the dais and say something that I don't mean and can't stand behind. Uh, but with, with that in mind, we are certainly open to a ground lease execution and have executed long-term ground leases with and a number of municipalities. Yeah. Uh, including the city of Miami Beach, uh, where uh, we now office in a building we built on a ground lease that we leased from the city of Miami Beach for 99 years. Uh, we've built a hotel uh, with them as well with a similar structure. So we're very, very familiar um, with uh, with those sorts of executions. Uh, on the second piece, and you know, we, we do this a fair amount around the country, so uh, please uh, take this suggestion with a bit of a grain of salt, but uh, in terms of the motion, uh, we'd be uh, excited to uh, negotiate the term sheet and explore options surrounding maximizing affordability within the context of the broader objectives. Yeah, thank you. And and, and colleagues, I, I the reason why I'm stuck on the options and the ranges because I'm thinking about the loan, I'm thinking about the size of it, I'm thinking about the the what we can get from it. So I, that's why I want to hear what the options are before I commit to saying, you know, a land lease versus just selling straight out or selling with terms. So that, you ever heard me fall down on either side of that because I want to hear what the options are. But go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm also just curious while you're up here, like what, you know, these two things that we want to look at in more detail, like what feels like a reasonable time? Because I think that also might affect what type of motion we pass tonight. Does it, right? It doesn't, I mean, to me, it's like, if we're gonna put it on um, GBA and then we're gonna go towards a, I mean, I- If, if I may, yeah. I, I, I understand your you, question. Where our schedule is, has a 10 day difference. No, no, of course, of course. Back. So So here's how I would suggest we work through the process. Uh, to me, the motion on the agenda is to, uh, award the or so select a preferred development partner and authorize staff to negotiate in order to maximize affordability within the context of the broader objectives. That'll then get voted on, I think, in the 18th. And then staff is going to come to us 
We'll sit down. We'll negotiate a term sheet that's going to speak to all of those things, Commissioner Cook or Council Member Cook, that uh, that you're looking for. Uh, we'll negotiate a relatively extensive term sheet, uh, which will have within it. Uh, and again, this is take this with a grain of salt. Uh, this is certainly how we've done this other places, and I think it's relatively efficient. Uh, a term, a broader term sheet that captures not only the terms of the disposition, whether it be fee simple or a long-term ground lease, the terms of the affordability, not just particular AMI bands, but duration, the terms of the financing and the bond, inclusive of the term and the interest rate and the repayment mechanisms. And then we'll return back to you all to bless that term sheet. Uh, we can do that relatively quickly. Um, and uh, would anxious to say that if not by the next council session, depending on how your agendas work, uh, the one after that, uh, we're excited and, and ready to move forward. So, and and just take this with a grain of salt. Um, I, I, Start that last I'm, I'm excited because I like the way you guys work, but uh, <laughs> yeah, we're gonna take our time and hurry up. We were doing great for that last line. Yeah. 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 Um, Okay. Instead with a grain of salt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, just, just, and, and just, just for, no, the reason why I'm being really broad about it is because I want to make sure that, you know, uh, staff has a chance to really dissect and, and really like listen to what we've said, our dialogue today. Cause I, I don't want, I don't want this to get to the point where, you know, it's like one council member, you're trying to do this one council member, you're trying to do that. Listen to what we're saying as a council and staff and you all come up with the best options to present back to us. Um, <laughs> staff agrees. <laughs> right. And so, thinking, so what are we saying is the timing of that? That's, and I guess that's back to like Stacey and your team, right? And, and the, the development team. Yeah. Take, take, take your time and, and, and hurry up on this one. And we'll be, we'll be ready for it when you bring it back to us, but we want to make sure we get this right but I feel like we're getting close to making it happen within the next few months. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. A quick question for the development team. Would a, would a ground lease situation, that could potentially impact the amount of money up, up front we get, correct? Yes. All right. So, Mike, I, 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 I like your team. I like your team based upon the terms that are in front of me right now. I'm a bit... I mean, as a fiduciary of the city, I, I'm a bit uncomfortable with kind of locking a team in when the numbers are going to be different. Because I, I, I know you have a sterling reputation. I don't know that if the changes we're asking for, if presented to other teams, they could present better numbers. Um, so, so to kind of have a preferred um, vendor, if you will, and kind of guarantee we're going to give you our business and go tweak these numbers, they may come back favorable, but I, I don't have enough information to know that given, because the scenario now is changing, given that same scenario to another developer, their numbers wouldn't be better than yours. Um, so I, I can't publicly declare that I'm going to vote to give, you know, without seeing what those final numbers look like yet after you work them. And I don't know that somebody else couldn't do better than what you bring back under the amended terms. So I, I like you guys very much, but I like you based upon what's in front of me right now. Mm. So as a decision maker and, and with, you know, with deference to my colleagues, I, I don't know that somebody else wouldn't bring better numbers under yeah. a ground lease situation. I think we'll your, oh, oh. But, but you want to respond to that? I, I'd, I'd love to. Uh, certainly uh, that, that point is well taken. I think that uh, I have two caveats. Uh, the first one is that we can structure a long-term ground lease to nearly identically mirror a fee simple disposition. Uh, we're doing that now with Massachusetts Department of Transportation and negotiated that with uh, with Scott Bosworth, with whom uh, you had the chance to speak with. Uh, the, the second piece is that uh, once we are authorized to negotiate with staff to the extent that uh, the body is not happy, with the changes made on the term sheet, uh, there is, in my understanding, no obligation to move forward with our team. Uh, our goal is to move forward with what's proposed uh, to the extent that uh, in the midst of this partnership, and we certainly perceive it as a partnership, uh, the objectives and structure were to change. Uh, 
we hope that they change in a way that is mutually beneficial and one that uh, allows all of us to move forward enthusiastically. Well, I appreciate that. But based upon what you said, then that that does that doesn't require a vote on our part to make any representations. Then you, I mean, you can do that work without us voting to say that you're our prefer, preferred. Uh... So, and and there's where there's a bit of a rub. Uh, it's as a partnership. Tell me. We we imagine that there's there incremental steps. I think the word that was used previously was fidelity. Uh, when we negotiate a term sheet and move forward in this process, uh, we'll spend tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars continuing and perpetuating uh, the uh, the program that we put forward. That's uh, right. When, when you ask for that same sort of, you know, commensurate effort on our part, we want to know uh, that you're not dating anybody else. Sure. No, absolutely. No, I, I, I feel you. I feel we, we, we don't want to run around on you. <laughs> and that's my point. That's my point. It's hundreds of thousands of you. It's millions for us as a city. Mm -hmm. And and I guess if you can guarantee us that whatever numbers you bring back, you'll beat anybody in the market. That's that's one thing. But again, as my responsibilities to the city of Durham. So I want to keep I, I'm prepared to keep fidelity with you based upon these terms that are in front of me now. But we are substantively asking you to do new math on different terms. So, and th the math may very well be beneficial for us, but I can't in good conscience, you know, say that I'm going to just, you know, uh, 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 date you. Uh, thank you, Kevin, for date, you know, without knowing that somebody else out there maybe more attractive. I hate this. Uh, no, no, but I, 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 I do like the metaphor and, and would love, would love to take it over from here. Uh, I, I think the, 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 what's, the, what's happened is that we've just met. And, uh, okay. I want to remind everybody, this is the Durham we, council, not tender. So let's uh, all right. bring it back. <laughs> uh, without a doubt. And to the extent that we move forward, Right. And there is fidelity and we both invest a meaningful amount of time, energy and effort in perpetuating this partnership. And to some degree, the body is not happy uh, with the program presented with small changes. Uh, then there is no obligation on behalf of the body to not move to another respondent. Uh, our goal is to know that we have the exclusive right to negotiate uh, and to respond uh, holistically or in part to all of your questions and concerns. All right, I'm going to go over here. Thank you. I, I, um, just really quickly, part of the thing that I just want to bring us back to is we're here also because there, there were many of us who had questions on this RFP process. That was not a not, this is not for the development team. So I appreciate this is for staff. I was one of the council members who, you know, we got kind of pushed along around the second round of RFP. And so we're here partly, I wanted lo lower, I wanted smaller commercial. I said that I was one of the folks. And in fact, the, la the land uh, the land option or the, the lease option was brought to us by staff after the failure of Fallon as a potential uh, financial bene benefit to the city because the market had changed so much. So some of this is because things have changed and some of it is because uh, with the RFP that got us here, there was a conversation of like, well, it's not binding or it's okay. We have opportunities to change. So I don't want to be told today. Well, actually that's not true because I was definitely one of the council members at the time who said, you know, how locked in are we going to be? And so we're back here in the same moment. How locked in are we going to be? And here are my concerns and my concerns have been pretty consistent. Uh, and so I am perfectly fine moving forward. I'm delighted with the proposal in front of us. I have two big questions. I would like to see the financials on it. I'm fine with the motions as they are, as long as those motions get me that thing. And if they're not going to get me that thing, then I'm not okay with the motions. That's it. It's very simple for me. Thank you. Council Member Freeman. Thank you. And I think to that point, I've I've felt your contention. And I think I've I've had a little bit on the, I just want to make sure that the units land. And so I, I do want to say that the motions as they are written, which is why I was trying to express, actually deliver just what we're asking for. And so I just wanted to make sure. So it was good to have the conversation and make sure that everyone's point of view, especially for the newer council members, were included so that you could get consensus around the board. Because I did, I think we heard consensus on the land. We heard consensus on well, I think we have part consensus on the hotel. I think we heard part consensus on um, 
There was one other thing. On the additional units, like, well, I think we have, and those things that are floating will come back to us with the actual contract for the deal. What I'm talking about is like after this negotiation, that would still come back to us. We would still be, I'm, I'm going to guarantee you there's going to be at least two, three, four more meetings where we have to have the same present, presenters uh, present and then also the folks from the community say the same things that they've said today a number more times. It is, I mean, I think we're at like at least 15 or 16 right now, but there will be at least six, at least four or five more. And so I don't want I what I what I felt like was happening is that it's it's almost like you feel like this is as we as we move, there's more reticence and hesitation. And I, and I feel like in this process we've gotten to a good point. We have a, a developer that the staff has recommended that more people are on board with than previously, and with the experience of the previous fault like Fallon situation. Uh, we're in a much better position than we were before. It's not the same. The things that we're talking about are all negotiation points. And I think your vote is the negotiating point of your, like that is your point of negotiation. Rather than making it a spelled out written thing in a motion, I feel like if we left these motions the same and we allowed staff to go back, that would be the simplest I won't say easy or quickest, but simplest way to move forward. Okay. Um, go ahead. So I think what, so I think we all recognize the experience that previously where we spent a year negotiating with Fallon and it comes back a year later and it's not what we want. We, and we're back to square one, right? So I think what we're saying here is that for for a number of us in the council to move forward with the motion to accept people's as preferred developer, there's a couple of things that are kind of non-negotiable. One is the ground lease. One is more maximizing affordability. Those are two things. And so if we can have more information on that, more some kind of some assurance by by the next meeting, happy to support the motion. If not, not ready. And so. just just to be clear, we those are they're not um non-starters. They are things that we're they're they're negotiating points. Cause we we you we don't make you know you know, you know it's like there are like three people that may want one thing, three people that want another. That doesn't mean the council is not going to go forward with it. So I just, I, I hear what you're saying. We want what we're doing is looking at those two main things as, all right, give us give us options around what it would look like if we sold both terms, sold straight out, or a ground lease. It doesn't mean we're not choosing you unless you give us the ground lease. So, so what we're saying is, let's move I'm forward. That's because we haven't taken a vote, so we don't have a position on this yet. We're giving direction. You are looking at the ground lease. You're looking at the ground lease. Someone else may be looking at the ground lease. That does not mean the Durham City Council is saying we're not going with you unless you give us the ground, unless we do the ground lease. What we're saying is give us the options of those. So we're saying let's move forward and allow the staff to go into negotiation with them and give us the options because right now they're far ahead than anyone else based on the uh, assessment. Um, th thank you, uh, Council Member Morrison and, and Mr. Mayor. So just just a <clears throat> point of clarity on what happened with Fallon. It wasn't that Fallon came back and we didn't like what they brought us. Fallon failed. The deal fell through. We took a, a duly uh, binding vote. We gave Fallon the business. Then they came back and said they did. They weren't able to. Uh, do the building, whatever it was at cost. So, so to, to be clear, this would be a done deal if Fallon were able to carry through with what they said. We wouldn't be having this conversation right now. So I want to be clear about that. Um, secondly, I, just in terms of, I just want to be clear on what, what I'm, what I'm actually going to be voting on. If, if we're waiting for more information, then I, then I, I'm, I'm, I don't understand what the motions if I'm because when we cast a vote, that is a legally that's a legal thing when a council pass, uh, passes a vote, takes a vote. So am I I guess am, am I voting? Am I committing to you're our guy or person? Um, but in the meantime, go back and bring these numbers. And if you bring the numbers back and we don't like them. That nullifies the vote, the legally binding vote that that we took. Because for me, if, if, if we're waiting for more information to come, 
what's the point of, if, of voting? I mean, we can just have that arrangement. But and but I understand you. I understand the developers' position. They're looking for a lock in, a lock in with a lock on it. And if we're locking in on terms yet to be determined or or could possibly change, I'm just as a decision maker. I'm, I just want to be clear on what I am casting and committing the city to in a legal way, because you know the information. If we're awaiting more information, let's await more information before I cast a vote. Why do I need to cast a vote pending information? Let me let me get the um, let me get the purpose of the council real quick. Are we saying we are sending this back to staff? But if we do send it back to staff to reconsider, then that means we're sending this back for all applicants. I believe that's something we have to consider. Or are we like are we locking in and moving and allowing the, this developer to come back with options? Or are we saying we're not ready to move this to GBA yet and allow the changes to come back? But do know if that happens, then I, I believe, to be fair, it's going to be everybody. So we're going to go through this process all over again. I Personally speaking, um, individually speaking, rather, I, I think that I, I don't want to, I want to get this right. So I'm, I'm just kind of split here. I want to get this right. But at the same time, I don't want to be deemed as bad to do business with, you know, uh, and 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 I don't want to feel like I'm playing around with, you know, folks that are, I'm not spending money to do all of this. This is really expensive work. Uh, so I just want to put that out there that that's what, that that is, that is true because on this site, <laughs> so, um, so it's a matter of risk here uh, for me and I, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to, I'm, I'm ready to make a decision on that, but go ahead. Yeah, I actually totally agree with everything you said. I, I think it would be helpful. Could you say that again? Just yeah, for the record. I know. I for the record. Okay. Yeah, for just, a, just but I, 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 think really is, I, I think where we're getting stuck is that we don't have clarity around what our options are, because what I'm hearing is that some people are like, I'm ready to go to a, a fact sheet. And then other people are like, if, if this thing is not possible, then I am not willing to push this motion through. Right. And so like, that's a pretty big divide. Is there, is there middle ground that we can get to in this meeting that we can put on our council agenda that somehow meets both of those? Is there, is there a way to word this motion that is different than it is currently so that we can get that information so that folks can feel comfortable voting one way or the other? Go ahead. Thank you. I thought, um, Stacy offered suggested language on the second, which is what it's really the only one to it's the third one, that one. I thought there was a discussion on on kind of providing ranges, providing options. And so I thought that that was an OK suggestion because it gives us options, which is what I think many of us kind of want to know if it comes out that like a land, um, whatever it's called, uh, yeah, is terrible for the city, Mayor Pro Tem, I'm not going to vote for it. I just want to know what it looks like. It's like when I'm looking at interest rates and I want to know, you know, okay, do I get a 15 locked in, 15 year locked in mortgage? Or do I get a 30 year locked in mortgage? You know, it's like, just give me options because again, and I've already stated it, there were the many, or I was one of the council members who did not love the last RFP process. And I was told you're not, you're not having to buy the house right now. And now I'm feeling Right. pushed again and I'm not going to be pushed. I don't care if it takes us a minute. The market's been crazy for the last four years. And so I'm okay with making sure that we get the best bang for our buck. And six years ago, it was cash windfall that we never got. And so here we are again. So that's it. If there is language that can be added to the second part of that motion, the third, basically the third bullet, to allay the concerns of council members on ranges and options on the affordability and the retention of land. That is really all that needs to happen. Councilman Caballero, I agree with you. Um, but it, and you, I think the critical what you said is options, plural. This is one person. This is one entity. And the the there may be, if we're looking at a land lease, there may be another vendor out there who can do better than this one. Options, plural. Um, and, and, and my point, and that's precisely my point that I'm, I'm fully comfortable with going with this vendor under these terms, under this, that we've asked for, 
we are now asking for something different. And at the time we had the discussion, I mean, we all had our, we were reticent about something, had our anxieties about something, but we crossed the four vote threshold. That's why this RFP looks the way it is, because we got four people to say, this is what we wanted. This is what we've gotten. And based upon that, that in a very linear sense, based upon that process, I'm comfortable with this RFP, with this proposal as stated. If we are making substantive changes and a land lease versus what's before us is a substantive change, I'm not comfortable with saying, I want to just hear what you can do on this substantive change when there may very well be someone else out there that can do better. Thank you. Let me go to Councilman. Right, yeah. yeah. So I just want to be, and I want to turn to the city attorney if we could on this. So this idea that we sort of, that if we ask for some, so a couple of key changes here, that we somehow throw this thing in a flux and have to do a whole new RFP process. I think, and city attorney, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we have ample authority to, to negotiate with whomever we want, right? So so the idea that we have to somehow throw it back on a big process, I don't think that's correct. So, but, but correct me if I'm wrong. You are correct, council member. That it, you don't, you're not required to start back at ground zero. The thing we're saying is we want to have one more, before we start dating, we just want to have one more conversation, right? That's what, that's what we're saying. Right. So why do we, we don't have to vote then? And that my, I don't have a problem with them bringing back other recommendations, but listen to what he said. He wants us to be locked in, which I understand because they've spent money. I mean, we can get other options without voting. We can just ask, hey, would you bring us these numbers? and see what they look like. That's an option too. But if, if it's kind of like we want them without wanting them. I mean, if, if it is you is or is you ain't. I mean, if we're, if we're gonna go with them, then that's fine. And I have no problem with any of this. I'm just simply saying as one decision maker, I'm not gonna say yes when I wanna see some other information. Why would I do that? Well, good thing is we're not voting today. And, <laughs> and we're not right. And, but what we do have is we have to authorize the city manager to negotiate and execute a contract with consulting services for the disposition of the redevelopment of Five Five West Chapel Hill Street in the city of Durham. I, I appreciate Mayor Pro Tem and uh, um, Council Member Risk's um, commentary. I just want to add to that question Is there a legal liability? Um, and not so say for instance that one of the other rfp um applicants decided to sue us because we actually made all these changes and they could have provided something different what's the legal liability around that i'm going to invite senior deputy city attorney fred lamar up to answer but we do not believe that there's legal recourse yeah yeah uh, good afternoon fred lamar with the city attorney's office um, no, we we have discretion in this case to decide that we prefer, you know, we're, by, by the way, just as a clarification, Mayor Pro Tem is, I don't think that by accepting, by directing um, staff to start negotiating with peoples that we have accepted their proposal precisely because th their proposal is not sufficiently detailed for anything to to permanently accept what what I believe you're doing by authorizing this is just that is just saying we like peoples we looked at what we looked at these other folks their qualifications what they presented um, and we like the people's package best not perfect it's not the the one uh, that we want that we know we're going to end up with but we like it enough to give you direction to continue communications and negotiations with them and I think that a lot is. I think we are not sort of in response to council member um, Freeman's comment. It is unlikely staff's going to come back to you the next time with a, a development agreement to sign. It's highly unlikely because um, there's a lot of negotiation that's going to happen. There, there are commitments on the part of the, uh, of, on the part of the uh, consultant to the, I'm sorry, in the part of um, people's the developer that they're going to have to make investments as part of the negotiation. You know, in my mind, that's up for discussion. What do we need from them to feel confident enough that we can um, enter into binding, a binding term sheet or a, a binding um, uh, um, development agreement? But all of that is, is we, it is very, very, in my opinion, very, very preliminary. I, I think all you all are, 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 are trying to do right now is to give direction to the, to the uh, staff to say, 
We like the direction you're going. Keep keep going more or less in that same direction, but come back. You know, we understand you're going to come back and check check in with us again before the city's you know committed. Um, and so I think that will be a number of steps. Did I answer? And so I'm not. Let me let me to answer your question more succinctly. The city didn't have to do an RFP. The city could have just found a consultant they really liked and a, a team that they really liked said, hey, we want to develop the city owned property. All we need to do is make sure that whatever funding and however we dispose of the property complies with um, the state constitution and we have storage statutory authority to follow the procedures for that. We could have picked our own private negotiation with our private developer, but that's not, obviously that's not the way that y'all wanted to operate and you've made it an open process. Um, will, uh, uh, will one of the uh, uh, proposers sort of complain, say, I can do better if you give me another chance? Maybe, I mean, but it's at the discretion of the city to decide whether or not they wanna, wanna go through that process. Council, may I ask a question? Does it require a motion or a vote for us to direct the management the city manager to have further talks no it does not and that that is and my my comments hinged on the motions and 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 voting because and i think and this has been very helpful i mean i'll vote to say i like them i i do like them um and but my concern is that well i've already stated my concern but that's very helpful we don't have to vote or uh, to direct the manager to continue conversations with that's that's a yeah, great I'm, point, but I think that to that point, that's where it becomes sticky because then each council member's viewpoints are not coalesced. And so I will say that to council member Caballero's um, noting in the last process, the only reason I was okay with going forward is because I understand like it's, it's non-binding. And if four council members felt a certain way about the number of units or the land, or whether or not Milton Small was there, like all of those things are still up for debate all the way through until this is, till the contract is signed. And so I, that's why I was okay the last time because I heard you, I felt, I felt the tension the last time as well. And it was only two of us who were up for keeping the building. And, and yeah, so it was, it was still a possibility that it could go away. I'm not, and that, which is why I appreciate what Councilmember Middleton, I'm a Mayor Pro Tem Middleton, is saying as far as like trying to hold fidelity in the process. If we want to open it up and make it, a, a, you know, a, you know, open for grabs, we, what I'm concerned about is that our name is muddy. If we were to make those funds available for people specifically to go out and do what needs to happen next, I would feel more comfortable if we want to open it up and, and say whatever this, that, and the other, because what is happening is that we are limiting, we're, we're going to continue to limit ourselves and who's willing to do the business with us. And the cost of the production is going to go up dramatically. I know that November's coming, winter's coming, but, but, but we don't want, we don't want to, we don't want to wait for what we don't know. And what I'm clear on is that this is an opportunity right now to do a lot of what we've talked about over the last seven years and allow for folks to pour in some of the some of their thoughts and ideas around what they would like to see, even though they're newer to council. So the cool. I, I appreciate the two items that you said to add into the 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 third motion and the rest of the motions remaining the same. And if we could at least get four people to say they would like to move forward with that, I think we could wrap up this meeting. I think there's unanimity in first of all, I based upon council's statement, I don't I don't think we need a motion or a vote to direct staff to have further conversations and explore. And there's unanimity. I want I'd I'd like to get information about the ground lease. No, I'm not opposed to that. I'd like to get information about more units. I'm an affordable housing person. That, that's how I got involved in politics in Durham. So I'd love to see more units. But if we can do that and not have to vote on it, I mean, just have staff have the conversations and bring us back what they, uh, you know, what they find, and, and then we can take it from there. That's where I am. So, Madam Manager. So uh, there are actually um, four motions here. Well, you know, the top one was obviously to re receive a presentation. Uh, having conversations with um, the partners that we that we consult with um, 
are not are not free conversations, and you know that. Okay. So two of these motions, um, you know, as we're moving to where we're going, we we definitely would need to um to adopt the third and fourth motions in order to continue to have um discussions mm -hmm. and move this project forward. We would definitely need to have to do that. No, 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 on, on GBA. All right, so colleagues, let us please, uh, I, I think that we we have some direction here um, and and we have 11 days for this to, the motions to be modified to our liking. Um, I think what staff needs today is, are we moving forward? Madam Manager, wait. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I mean, obviously, obviously we need to pay them if they're gonna do more work. To be clear, I am prepared to cast a vote for base, the base proposal. I'm prepared to, but my colleague, we're not there as a council. So secondarily, beyond that, I'm prepared to, to empower them to have further conversations with, with staff around what my colleagues, the points my colleagues have brought up uh, and pay them. Yeah, so obviously, you know, I'll, I'll vote, but I'm prepared to adopt base plan A. But since we're not there, I'm prepared to support further conversations around land lease and more units and to pay them for those conversations. All right. And the them, you, you're talking about is specific to the consultant. Uh, consultant, executive, yeah, consultant. consultant. But my, my bad. Yeah, our yeah. Yeah. Cool. So we're, we're, we're um, Stacey, do you have what? Um... <laughs> All right. So colleagues, can we get a, can I get a thumbs up on, on at on least one. motions of three and four? Yeah. All right. You know what? Mayor Froten, please take over. I am over here twitching because I need to use the restroom. <laughs> yes, sir. Stacey, you wanted to uh, say something? So, um, so, so the same way the consultant would be expending additional funds, you know, the development team will be expending funds. I mean, there is a lift here. Um, the development proposals that we've received are very different. It feels like there is consensus around one firm with the six goals. And I'm wondering if the motion number two could be modified to add at the end of it with consideration around possibilities for revisiting the number of units and um, and a land lease and, and, and passing a motion to allow us to go to a term sheet with those other factors highlighted for us for our extra attention, allowing us to move forward with the developer, giving them some fidelity for the work that they've expended over the last year. And also, you know, sort of, affirming to the development community that that we we are we are on the right path and we want to move this project forward and that you know doing business in, in Durham makes sense and that that we're headed towards a, a conclusion of you know a, of a term sheet okay with yeah. considerations for the possibility with consideration towards the number of units of affordable housing and consideration of a land lease so we will move forward as a staff with those things, heightened things in mind, as we begin to negotiate with the developer around a term sheet, which we will bring back that term sheet to council for consensus and approval, which is what we have done previously. Colleagues, but, I'll pull, I'm sorry. Excuse Colleagues, me. I'll pull the house. Um, just a clarifying question. I mean, we're not actually taking a vote like that, that direction we would be giving you at the meeting when we took a formal vote on it. This works up, and we are not doing that. Correct. Correct. We would revise the motion and present back to you for we'll the Monday night for the vote. Okay. My, my only question then is like, so so this process, you, you said we will sort of modify the motion potentially just to include this sort of like revisit for a consideration, and you'll bring back that term sheet. So how long does that process take? Is that like two months, two years? Like. <laughs> So I think um, we have not engaged in conversations with this particular developer around the term sheet. What Where we were last time is we started on a term sheet and we ended up with a full development agreement. So I think if there's some intentionality and conversation we could have with the developer between now and the Monday night meeting, we could give a sense of the range and the attorneys a sense of, you know, a high level term sheet of what it might take. Fred is coming over here. Thank you. Um, 
Fred Lamar with the city attorney's office. Um, I think that to, to my understanding is the council wants to look at um, the similar proposal from people's, but looking at the ground lease and the added affordable. In my mind, that look is something you would do before you negotiate term, term sheet. I mean, term sheets can mean different things, um, but it just seems like if you're, otherwise it sounds like you're asking for two term sheets um, because the term sheet is really the deal points that you will put into a development agreement. And so they're, they're pretty much, you know, hard boiled. Uh, I, at least in my opinion, I think that they would be. So, so if my understanding is there's maybe an interim step before I'm looking for Stacy before, before um, they would come back with that term sheet, say, hey, we've looked at the numbers again. Remember that proposal we submitted? We, we've um, presented it in a similar sort of high level format and here's what it looks like. Which one do you want us to go to with to do the term sheet? That would be my recommendation. Which goes precisely to my earlier point. We're, we're polling the house, council member um, uh, Yeah, I've been, I mean, since the time that that was suggested to add a little bit more specificity on that motion, I've been fine with it. I'm, I'm gonna. I'm going to trust the folks who do this to to tell me. I just don't want to shut the door. That's it. And I said that 30 minutes ago. Councilmember Freeman, and fine. Councilmember, uh, Mr. Mayor, I yield back. Well, keep I was polling the house. Keep going. To, keep going. Keep sorry. Going. Um, Stacy, have you discerned clear direction from us based upon that? Yes, we will draft a revised motion and come back on the Monday night, and we will have conversation with our attorneys around. The word term sheet and what that what will be in a term sheet and so maybe there's three steps here instead of two and kind of what what is in that so we will have those conversations all right so your honor you should have left them earlier <laughs> I, I see that <laughs> I see put, that. A, put, a, put a bow on it thank you so madam manager do you have any final comments or direct are, are we clear all right i i think we i think that's it on this topic mr mayor i'll yield back I'm yielding All right, back. thank you. <laughs> yeah, I uh, just um, uh, just a moment of personal and professional privilege here. I just want to thank you all. Um, just how rich our civic discussion can actually be. Um, I this it's an honor to be able to like get so deep into details around policy like this. This is good work. Yeah, I just want to echo that and say I'm. I'm actually um, grateful that the storm came so that the kids did not start school today and I could stay past three. <laughs> yes, yes. This was going to be, it was supposed to be a short meeting. Um, however, <laughs> Councilmember Cook, this was not your fault today. All right. So I, I just wanted to say thank you guys. Um, I mean, I know folks are watching on YouTube and across across the way. We have other council members across the state that actually do tune into Durham City Council. Uh, so this was, uh, you want to get deep into policy, folks. That's how you do it. Thank you all so much. Uh, we need to settle the agenda.